Okay, and we are live. Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are located. But it is good afternoon from Lagos, Nigeria. We're so glad you could join us on this webinar slash book launch tag journey to series A. Um, thank you so much for putting this on your calendar. Thank you for keeping this date with us. We guarantee that this will be worth your while. So yeah, welcome once again. And I would like to reiterate that this webinar slash book launch, it is powered by HealthCap Africa. HealthCap Africa is a Pan-African pre-series A fund. I will come back to that in a bit, but HealthCap Africa is a Pan-African pre-series A fund. And today we have a very interesting lineup of speakers. We have a book reviewer and we have panelists who are all highly experienced industry specialists. Now, each of them is fully competent to speak on this topic. And I'm convinced that there will be a lot of takeaways from this webinar. So please take my word for it. Have your notes, your pens, your papers, have them ready. And very importantly, please keep an open mind. Keep an open mind to learn, relearn and unlearn. Right, so without taking any more time, let's just get right into it. Welcome once again. So I will just be giving a really quick backdrop to this webinar. I just want to set the tone for the webinar. So like I said, HealthCap Africa is a pre-seed slash seed stage fund, and we invest in health tech and fintechs across Africa. We use our deep subject matter and expertise in these sectors. Health Cap Africa, we add value to our portfolio companies. That's really what this webinar is about. We add value to our portfolio companies in unique ways. Now, like I said, we are sister portfolio companies. And one of the things we're trying to do with this webinar and the book, which we'll be launching today, is to help our portfolio companies in their journey as they head towards the series A round. So in turn, the idea is to help them start helping them early enough and offer them the support that they need as they raise their Series A funding. So this Journey to Series A book and this webinar that we're on right now, it is designed for funders, it's designed for founders, and it's also designed for policymakers, like there is something for everyone on this webinar right now. This webinar and the book we will be launching, it provides insights on how startups, can overcome significant transition in expectations, trans, um, ex the transition that comes with and the expectations that come with reporting and governance while they are embarking on their journey to series A rate. So like I said, there will be a ton of things to take away from this webinar. Right to get right into it, like I said, we will be calling our founder in person of Dr. Ola Brown. I'll just give a real short intro into who she is and her capabilities, like I've already mentioned. Dr. Ola Brown, she'll be giving the opening remarks and then she'll give her opening remarks and then right after that, I will come back on and then introduce the very next stage of this webinar. We intend to be punctual, we intend to keep to keep the time and not take any more time than we already should. I actually do apologize that we did start a little bit late. Sorry about that. Uh, just a little bit of technicalities that we needed to work around. Great. So like I said, Dr. Ola Brown, she's a seasoned venture capitalist. She's a two time fund manager and an investor in nearly 30 companies. Like I said, every other speaker is fully competent to be speaking at this webinar today. Dr. Ola Brown, like I said, she has invested in nearly 30 companies, all of them within the fintech and health tech sectors. Dr. Ola's first fund returned 25% IRR. IRR will be internal rate of return. And in addition to her first venture capital firm, which she co-founded alongside other two directors, Dr. Ola has founded and now is running HealthCap Africa. And again, like I said, this webinar is being powered by Health Cap Africa. And she founded this company in 2020 to focus on venture capital investing and infrastructure. To date, Health Cap has invested in about almost 20 in about 20 startups, 
in the fintech and health tech sectors with a total valuation of about $700 million. Dr. Ola will be sharing tips, insights on Series A funding at this webinar. So please, let's have Dr. Ola Brown take it right away. Dr. Ola, please. Hi, um, it's great to be here. My name is Dr. Ola Brown and thank you, Marion, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's so nice to be uh, speaking about this particular book um, because um, it's really special to me. When I first graduated from medical school, I wrote my first book, which is called EMQs and Pediatrics, which was really a practice book um, of questions and answers um, for medical students. Uh, during their paediatrics rotation, um, because at that point I felt I wanted to be a paediatrician. Um, my second book um, was called um, Emergency Medicine um, for Africa, um, and that was really focusing on pre-hospital care um, and how pre good, efficient pre-hospital care um, in Africa was a lot different from the kind of um, pre-hospital care, emergency care um, that you would see um, in the developed world and really trying to help people understand um, how to get patients to the right hospital within the right time frame. Um, my third book um, was called uh, Fixing Healthcare in Africa, which was a policy book, um, and that was sort of uh, in my transition period um, from uh, medicine to economics um, and it was really focused on the right healthcare policies and the right economic environments um, that would be required um, for African countries um, to be able to get the right healthcare in place. My fourth book um, was called Banking, Finance and Economics um, in Emerging Markets. And Hello, sorry. Um, so I was just speaking about emerging markets when an emerging market problem happens, um, but we're back back online now. So I was saying that um, my fourth book was about emerging market problems, uh, lack of electricity, um, as well as um, uh, a, a lot of economic policies that aren't specifically um, written for emerging markets and are more suited to more developed markets. Um, so this is my fifth book called Journey to Series A um, and it's really kind of written out of experience. Um, I started investing in venture capital and um, co-founded um, my first venture capital fund in 2015. Um, and at that point, I was investing in seed um, and pre-seed. Um, and one of the things I started to realise is that if founders um, of startups weren't 100%, you know, um, focused, even by the end of the seed, on things like governance um, and other hygiene issues, um, then it would be very difficult um, for them to be able to raise a Series A. Um, so what I started doing quite early on is saying, as soon as you finish raising your seed, we need to start getting you in shape for Series A. Um, and the, I held a lot of coaching sessions with a lot of different founders. I sent a lot of emails um, and through experience um, of founders going from seed to Series A, I gradually began, began to put together what I would say is a framework um, for a great Series A. And I wanted to put all of that into a document. Um, and I started off with just a one page document. Um, but as I started to write and I started to put down my experiences, it gradually got longer and longer and longer. Um, so when I decided to write the book, I really wanted a 40 page book. That was all I wanted. I wanted a really short, sharp ebook um, with just 40 pages um, that would outline the journey from a successful seed to a successful Series A. Um, but as I continued writing, um, it went from like a single page, which was what I intended to 40 pages and then I realized that I needed to write another 10 more pages um, and now it's at 114 pages. 
Um, so it's no longer uh, as, as simple as I wanted it to be. But what I have done is put a lot of pictures um, and a lot of summaries in the book. So you don't have to read the entire book. Um, you can actually just stick to some of the summary pages. And those summary pages do give an overview of um, a lot of the most important concepts um, when you're thinking about raising Series A. This webinar just isn't aimed at founders, though. It's also aimed at people in the VC space, um, because I'm sure a lot of fellow venture capitalists also have struggled with like a one sort of document um, that they can refer to or give to um, founders in their portfolios that would sort of outline all the steps that they need to take um, when they're raising Series A. Um, and in terms of also policymakers, um, the policymaking space has been a lot of new elections in Africa, a lot of new people in government. And I think there's one big thing on all of these policymakers' minds. How can we attract um, capital to Africa? Africa has 15% of the world's population, but only 1% um, of global trade. So how can we attract more investment? Because investment means jobs. Um, investment means people making better livelihoods. Investment means lifting people out of poverty. Um, so if I wanted to sort of summarise um, the main points of the book, um, I would start by talking about, or I started by talking about alternatives to Series A. So if you don't feel you're ready to raise a Series A round, what are the alternatives? And I spoke about bridge rounds um, and seed extension rounds. I also spoke about um, venture debt as a viable um, alternative to raising uh, Series A. I also talk, spoke about bootstrapping um, as a potential way or a potential alternative to raising Series A. But if you have made that decision um, to raise, raise your Series A, um, then the bulk of the book um, is about the things that need to be put in place um, to raise a successful Series A. And it's divided into four sections. It's divided into the fundraising process and elements about the fundraising process. It's divided into communication with employees, which is the second section. And then the data room, how to put together a Series A data room, as well as compliance, um, meaning really how to make sure that um, when Series A investors are doing their due diligence or in their due diligence process, um, that you have the right compliance documents um, to make you an attractive invest, um, prospect for investment. So in terms of the fundraising process, um, what really needs to happen in that regard? And I think the first point about the fundraising process is around um, having a wish list of the type of investors that you want in your Series A round. Are they going to be if you're a health tech, for instance, are they going to be pharmaceutical companies? Are they going to be medical equipment companies? Are they going to be people that might want to buy your company um, at a later date? So when you're thinking about your Series A rounds, um, thinking about who you would want on that cap table and developing that list is really important. I also spoke about timing. Um, when I did a random survey um, of people, um, not professional investors or founders, um, but just people on Twitter. And I said, you know, how long do you think it would take to raise a Series A round? I got answers ranging from a week um, to two weeks to a month. Um, but actually, um, in my book, I say that um, founders that are thinking about a Series A round should start thinking about it and start building the networks 18 months before, which is a much much longer time um, than I guess most people um, would anticipate. But first of all, um, in terms of the fundraising process, building that fundraising tracker and looking at names, um, I would probably say about 50 names um, that you would most want on your cap table and trying to build networks um, to be able to connect with them. Um, there's a quote that I really, really like from the Harvard Business Review, and it says the best time to build your network is before you need it. And the best time to keep that network strong is always. Um, and I think that that's a very, very um, instructive um, for founders raising their Series A round to be very, very intentional um, about the type of investors that they want and building up that um, investment tracker or wish list. Um, the second thing that you want to do 
is ensure that you're very, very well connected to your seed investors. Um, if you're reporting regularly, if you have a good relationship with your seed investors, then your seed investors probably know other seed investors. So preparing your forwardable blurb, and there's a whole sort of section on how to prepare your forwardable blurbs. A forwardable blurb is something that your current investors or anybody that wants to make an introduction for you can introduce. It's about a few lines on an email um, that they can forward to other investors um, to connect you with them. Um, and it has to say what you're most proud of about your company, the most um, important metrics about your company on your forwardable blurb. Obviously, preparing the pitch deck um, also is a process that takes time. Both your teaser deck, which is usually under 10 slides, not very detailed, um, which contains sort of the highlights of the company and the things that you'd want an investor to know immediately. Remember that an investor is only going to look at that pitch deck for a few seconds or, minute, or at most a minute. So the most important things about your company go on the teaser, whereas the pitch deck itself is a much longer document um, that tells your story in more detail. So preparing those documents and getting them right and getting feedback on them, both from your employees and also from your existing investors, is a process that takes time as well. And remembering that that pitch deck is is a live document so you may need to tweak it for certain types of investors and if it's not gaining traction then you may need to change it completely um, so it's a live document that continues to be tweaked as the fundraising process goes on preparing your financial model um, to raise a successful series a you usually need to have um, a basic financial model um, a financial model is an excel document um, that is that investors will use to look at your business. Um, and by that, I mean how your business is performing currently um, in terms of how you're doing on margins, um, how you're doing in terms of um, your other financials, um, like your revenues, and then how you project that that business will grow over time. Um, and that's a very, very important um, part. There's a whole chapter on that in the book um, that goes over how to build your business model and what Series A investors will be expecting um, from that financial model. Um, then there's uh, building out your investor tracker. So when you're in the fundraising process, I think one of the most important things is running what I call a tight process. And I talk about that a lot in the book. So you have the names of all the investors that you're speaking to. Um, and I show you sort of in the book how to build out your investor tracker. So you have the names of all the investors that you are speaking to interesting things about them. So remembering who they are, what they do, what kind of fund they run, um, any personal details that you remember about them. The next column being what the next steps are. Have you sent the deck? How soon should you be following up? Because when you're speaking to 50, 60, 70, even 100 different investors, it can get confusing and things can slip through the cracks. Um, and one thing that's very important in a tight process is following up when you say you're going to follow up. So if you say, I'm going to follow up in a week, then make sure that email goes out in a week. But that's quite difficult to do for 50, 60 people. So whether you're using some kind of CRM software or whether you're using uh, some kind of um, C C CRM, whether you're using Google Sheets, whether you're using Excel, um, whether you're using another type of software um, to track um, who's, um, what conversations you're having, it's really important to be running a tight process and have those tracking mechanisms in place. Um, one big thing um, that I think is important and again occupies a whole section of the book is communication with your employees. The due diligence will include people who want to speak to your employees um, and um, when investors are coming into your organisation, they'll want to speak particularly to your sales team, to your engineering team, um, to your CFO, uh, to your HR team. So making sure that other team members are briefed about what you're doing and making sure that they're also, uh, they also understand the process of raising Series A and what investor expectations are and the standards that they should have um, internally in terms of systems and processes. So when your CFO or your H head of HR or head of sales or head of marketing is being interviewed by an investor, um, they're prepared, they know their numbers, uh, and they're confident enough to be able to articulate um, your company's story. And I also think another aspect of communicating with expert, um, with um, with employees is also letting them know that you're going to be out fundraising. 
So a lot of the founders, um, when put in the post-seed stage, are very, very operationally involved in the business. But fundraising is almost a job on its own. So your COO, for instance, or your general manager, or your CFO might have to start taking a bit of that burden of operational day-to-day -day work off of you when you're fundraising. And that's another reason why it's really important to speak to your employees and know, let them know that, you know, things are going to change a bit um, in terms of the day-to-day -day while you're fundraising because you're going to be continually speaking to investors. And the expectation is that they'll be able to, during the fundraising process, they'll be able to take a little bit of that um, strain off of you from the day to day operations while you're meeting investors, you're traveling or on the road um, uh, fundraising. So I've spoken about the fundraising process, which is the first section of the book. I've spoken about communication with employees, which is the second part of the book. And now I think one of the difficult, most difficult things to put together is the data room. So I'll say a bit about that. Um, so in terms of the data room, your registration documents are important. Um, and not just important in terms of um, making sure you're a registered company, but important in terms of strategy. What type of investors are you raising from? If you're registered in Nigeria, or Tanzania or Kenya or um, Ghana, are you raising from the type of investors that would invest in a Nigerian company? So domiciliation does become material um, at Series A. So being able to understand if investors are expecting like a Delaware C Corp, for instance, or whether if you're raising from the Middle East, um, if they would want you to be registered in Saudi Arabia or Dubai, or if you're registered in Europe, um, um, or if you're raising from European investors, would they expect you to be registered in London? So I think your incorporation documents are really important from the perspective of, you know, having them, but also important from the perspective of, what type of investors are you raising from? Financial statements. Now, I was a founder um, before I started um, my VC company. Um, so this is a mistake that I've made. Um, during the due diligence process for a Series A, every single one of your management accounts will be scrutinized. And by management accounts, I mean from inception. So if your business has been in business for five years, the expectation from a Series A investor is that you have a profit and loss, a cash flow statement, and a balance sheet from every single month of operations. So you need to have a file in your data room that contains all of your management accounts. Three statements from every single month that you've been in operation. And not just three statements, all of those three statements should link back to the original trial base, um, trial balance on Excel. No investor that I know anyway wants to see cash accounting. So if you've been doing cash accounting instead of accrual accounting, then you need to go back and rebuild those accounts in accrual. If your CFO or accountant isn't familiar with the IFRS later standards, then that's something that they definitely need to learn. So when you're raising Series A during the due diligence process, you'll be asked for three financial statements for every single month you've been in operations. Um, so those should all be separate neat files um, in your data room for all your management accounts. Your business plan um, should just be a brief document describing what you're going to do going forward, where you think the sources of um, revenue are going to come from. Market analysis is really important. Um, so any external reports that have been written about your market to get credibility, some of them maybe have to be paid for, some of them are free online. So if you have a PwC report or a McKinsey report on your industry, stick it in the data room, that's always useful. If you produced reports as a company, then stick those in the data room as well. Those are also important. Your cap table. Um, and sometimes if you've had a load of angels and a slightly messy cap table, you might need to tidy that up. So it would mean some financial engineering in terms of getting all of those different names. Like some people have a lot of investors that have put, you know, $500 checks in or 
dollar checks in and you have you know a hundred of them on your cap table so just tidying them all up into SP, um, SVPs and getting all of those legal documents in place so the cap table is tidy um, is something that definitely needs to happen um, your product roadmap so where your product is now any demos that you have of the products any video demos particularly um, your code probably will be audited um, during your series um, your series a so making sure that your lead engineer for example is available to answer any question um, on your product and the code permits and licenses if you have any intellectual property we invest in health tech so there's a lot of intellectual property um, in terms of new therapeutics and stuff so making sure that all of those are available your sales and marketing strategy is important your board um, and all the shareholder materials so minutes of the meetings of your board um, for example should all be um, in the data room um, as well as the profiles of your board members um, like i said all of your employee information should be in the data room as well, um, especially the profiles of your top executives. Um, and then any legal issues that you've had. So if anybody sued you, for instance, or if you're suing anybody, um, then that definitely needs to be um, in the legal part of the um, data room. Um, and one thing that people forget that is really, really useful to put in the data room is customer feedback. So if you have any videos of happy customers um, talking about your product, um, or if you have any net promoter scores, for instance, or if you've done any analysis um, at all, any sort of um, analytics of your customer feedback, then that's always good um, to have in your data room as well. Um, happy customers, videos of happy customers, written testimonials um, are always brilliant because that shows that you are building a product um, that people love. Um, in terms of compliance, um, your corporate governance documents, so the way your board works um, is important. Minutes, like I said, of any shareholder meetings uh, or any board meetings, if you've had an annual general meeting, for instance, um, the minutes of that meeting um, should also be in your data room. Um, share certificates, um, bank statements and their finance. You, you don't necessarily need to put that in the data room, but people may ask for your bank statements. So just make sure that they're all available and your bank is aware um, that those requests might come in. Um, for the Nigerians, um, our tax system is quite complex. If your company is registered in Nigeria, then investors will expect to see your TIN um, and any other communications from the FRS. Um, so they will expect full compliance in terms of having your tax. And tax is 30% of PAT if you're making a profit. They'll be expecting your um, to see your ITF contributions um, as well as any other sorts of compulsory compliance um, documents. Um, any insurance um, is also part of compliance. Any litigation from employees is also part of um, what investors will need to see, um, as well as your HR policies um, and the contracts with, that you have with all of your um, team members, as well as um, any um, employee shareholding um, agreements that you have. So in the book, we cover all of this in detail. Um, the four sections, like I said, are the fundraising process, communications with employees, your data room and compliance. And um, we cover all of those sections um, or all of those topics um, in detail um, in the book. One thing that I wanted to also, um, before we move to the next section, one thing I also wanted to talk about is Series A pitfalls. Um, so what can go wrong um, when you're in a fundraising process? Um, I think one thing that is material that I guess a lot of people don't realise is that fundraising actually costs money, particularly when you're going for a sophisticated round like a Series A. So having a low budget or no budget um, may pose a problem when you're raising Series A. So make sure that you do have a budget to raise the capital. Um, you might need to bring in a tax consultant, for instance. You might need to bring in um, somebody that's going to build the financial model if you don't have that uh, capacity internally. Um, you might need to bring in graphic designers, for instance, to put together the pitch deck. Um, you might be um, you might need consultants to help you um, with um, other thing, other elements like storytelling, for instance, and making sure that you do have um, a pitch deck that can um, att attract money. Um, and also, I think one expense that um, people don't realise is, is travel. You might need to travel to meet investors. You might need to go to a lot of conferences to meet investors. You might need to travel to demo days or pitch days um, to pitch your company. So there needs to be some kind of budget. So the number one series A pitfall that I 
um, see is people not putting aside um, the budget for fundraising. Um, it's a really serious fundraising round. Um, some people might even request uh, an audit from one of the big four consultants. I see that much more rarely um, because if you're registered um, in Delaware, then there's a whole host of really good auditors that aren't big four. But if you're registered in Nigeria, you might be asked um, for a big four audit or at least, um, you know, an audit from the little four, um, the Nigerian little four like SIO, I guess, or Padabo, um, for instance, um, just to give investors that extra layer of um, reassurance. Um, the second thing I see um, in terms of Series A pitfalls is a poor record, financial record keeping. Um, like I said, and I, I, I keep on repeating this because I see it so many times. Um, you do need, and as soon as we invest at seed or pre-seed, we make sure of this with our portfolio companies. You do need a cash flow statement. You do need a balance sheet. And you do need a profit and loss statement for every single month you've been in operation. And they need to be accrual accounting. They need to be IF, IFRS standards. And they need to link back. So if any um, investor wants to do deeper due diligence and look at your trial balances, they need to be able to link back on a separate sheet um, to those original trial balances so that they can see where all of the figures on your financial statements on your monthly um, accounts came from. So I've spoken about low to no budget, which is my first pitfall. I've spoken about um, poor financial record keeping, which is the second pitfall. The third is ugly data room documents. So sometimes you just see a data room that you don't want to look at. Um, the documents aren't well designed. Um, they look haphazard. Um, the logos aren't properly sort of um, put, put on put, uh, put onto the documents. Um, there's no uniformity with the documents. Try to make everything in your data room look as pretty and readable as possible. Um, try and put cover sheets on your financial model, for instance. Try and make sure that your um, files are, are labelled nicely so that people aren't rooting through the data room trying to find different things. Um, try to, if you have customer testimonials, um, try and make sure that they're well edited um, and subtitled if necessary. Try and make sure that all the reports in your data room also just look nice um, to the eye because um, sometimes that matters. Um, four, um, and I've mentioned this before, is not allocating the right amount of time. So thinking like on my Twitter survey, thinking that you know it's going to take a week or two um, when it really is the journey to Series A. Um, it's it's got, it, particularly in this fundraising environment, it actually does take time and making sure that you're adequately prepared and you don't run out of money um, before you get to the point where you can raise a Series A. The more desperate you get um, and the more Close, the closer you get to running out of money, the harder it is to raise because you have that additional financial pressure. And that financial pressure um, will probably lead you to agree to some pretty unfair terms. So just making sure that you start your Series A process when you're financially comfortable and when you have sufficient runway, um, that's really, really important. Um, the fifth thing is unprepared team members. Um, so investors are going to want to speak to your team. Um, and making sure that your team can actually articulate the company's story, uh, making sure that your team are aware of what investors want to know, and also making sure that your team members kind of know that you're not sort of gallivanting around the world um, and you're actually um, raising money and what the process of raising money entails and what extra work they may have to pick up as account of you being out of the office um, on, on, on a roadshow um, is really important. And the sixth one is um, unprepared founder. Um, and, you know, like I said, I wrote the book um, to help founders in our portfolio be able to prep for their Series A um, more effectively. Um, an unprepared founder is a founder that doesn't have a deep understanding of the marketing plan, um, can't answer any questions on the financial model, doesn't even know what's in the data room because they haven't looked at it, um, can't speak to the product without the help of the engineer. Um, and found uh, investors don't expect you to be an engineer or a CFO 
or a CMO, but what they do expect you to be is an articulate generalist who can speak to any section of the business on sort of a commonsensical level. Um, so you must know your margins, you must have a view on your revenue, you must have a, a perspective on when you're going to be cash flow positive. Um, they will ask you questions on the financial models and ask you to justify your projections. And those things I think are super important um, to be able to um, articulate to investors when you're asked direct questions. So in terms of Series A pitfalls, I said low to no budget, poor financial record keeping, ugly data room documents, not allocating the correct amount of time, unprepared team members, and most importantly, unprepared founder. Um, so I've gone from speaking about my first few books um, that I've written to one that I'm most excited about now, which is uh, Journey to Series A. I've also told you the reason why I wrote it, really to help founders um, with their Series A round or raising any round um, of capital for that matter. Um, helping VCs, giving them sort of one document that they can give to their founders um, to um, assist um, with all the checklists um, and to really guide them through that Series A process. And for policymakers, really looking to understand um, how they can raise money for the uh, or bring money, bring foreign capital into their countries. Um, so. During this speech, I've spoken about the Series A checklist. I spoke about the fundraising process, communication with employees, data room and compliance. And then I went on to speak about the Series A pitfalls and things to avoid um, when you're raising your Series A. Um, I think I've taken more time than I should have, but I really wanted to give that overview. Um, everybody on this call will be receiving a copy of the book free of charge, um, but I wanted to give this overview because I think it's very different from reading it in a book, hearing um, an expert speak about it. Um, and I look forward to interacting with you more in the Q&A, but now I'm going to hand back to the moderator, Marion, um, and she's going to take us into the next session. Sorry for taking so much time, Marion. <laughs> yeah. Doctor, we perfectly understand there was so much to say. There's like, like I already said, guys, that there's going to be a lot to take away. Like this was just opening remarks and already there are lots that I want to believe people's notes are already halfway filled by now. So yes, there are so many things Dr. Ola had mentioned. She talked about alternatives to raising a series A. All of this is contained in the book. And like she did mention, every attendee is going to be receiving a free copy, which is awesome, right? So yeah, the, she talked about alternatives to, um, to raising a Series A. Once you have your copy, you would get to see more about that. And then if you do decide, however, that you are ready to raise your Series A, oh, she did mention, by the way, that as a founder, if you think you're ready to start raising a Series A, you actually should have started thinking about it 18 months before you do start putting in the actual work. So like I said, she has a lot, there were, there, there were just a lot of things to take away from that. Um, but because we are a little bit behind time, we'll just move right next into the right into the next phase of this webinar, which is a chat with our keynote speaker. So there's a little twist to this. Our keynote speaker is here to um, share her own insights, give her own deep thoughts on the topic. Like I've already mentioned, she's perfectly capable and competent to deliver on this topic. However, we're going to be asking her a couple of questions. Dr. Ola would be championing that. She would ask her a couple of questions which would help to draw out the wealth of info that she has within her. So I'll just do a real quick intro into our speaker and then ask her to join us on the stage. Um, so her name, she's in person of Maya Hogan Famudu. I believe she's not new to most of us in this industry, literally to all of us in this industry. Maya is a venture capital investor and entrepreneur and a two-time Forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur. She founded Ingressive Capital, which is a which has raised two funds, a $10 million VC Fund 1 and a $15 million VC fund too, focused on early stage African techs. Now there are two aspects to this. There's Ingressive for Good, which is a non-profit providing micro scholarships, technical skills, training, and talent placement. Then there's also Ingressive Advisory, which is an advisory firm providing market entry, market ops services, and tech research 
for corporates and investors. Ms. Maya is right here with us, and trust me, this is something you want to pay attention to. Welcome to the Steve Maya and Dr. Ola Brown. Please take it away from here. Hello, Maya. Can you hear me okay? Here we go. Thank you. Um, Yay. Hello. Okay. How are you? Hi, how are you? So, um, gosh, we've got almost a thousand people in the room now. <laughs> so, uh, I feel like I'm speaking in a, on a stadium or something because there's so many people here. Um, so, hi, Maya. Um, so, Hello. just to give you some context, me and Maya are actually very good friends, but we hardly ever talk shop. So, I'm very, very interested in what Maya has to say um on this topic of fundraising um for founders um so before we start i know marion has introduced yourself but usually your formal profile introduction is a bit different from actually how you would introduce yourself so do you want to tell us a bit about yourself sure happy to um so for those who don't know uh my name is maya horgan famudu i am the founder of ingressive advisory ingressive capital and ingressive for good um, a little bit of background on the Ingressive Advisory. Uh, we were the first to bring some of the biggest tech funds and uh, tech corporates to Nigeria and help them make their first investments and launch programming across the continent, um, as well as do market research, et cetera, for these firms. Um, some of them include, we worked with Y Combinator, bringing their executive team to Nigeria, uh, 500 startups, Tech Crunch, or Tech Cabal, excuse me, not, not, not Tech Cabal. Um, tech Crunch. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, we also worked with GitHub, Figma, um, Google for Developers, Facebook, et cetera, a lot of these different types of organizations um, and tech stars, um, assisting them to enter the African market, make the first investments. For some, we even launched their Africa strategy for them and help make Nigeria fastest growing uh, country in their portfolio. Um, that company was profitable. We started investing the profits into tech companies across Africa. Um, eventually, with our clients, we launched Aggressive Capital Fund One. It was a 10 million fund one. Our first investment was Paystack, as you guys know, sold to Stripe. Um, we also had another company that sold to MFS Africa um, and currently working on our third acquisition in Fund One. Uh, that closed in 2018, fully deployed in 2021. Um, we're wrapping up things to announce our $50 million fund too. And uh, we also have Ingressive for Good, which is a nonprofit that trains uh, developers, designers, and product managers, and also sponsors computer science degrees and buy, buys laptops and data for African youth who want to learn tech. So yeah, that's a little bit about us. Um, I'm, I'm not a sophisticated Series A investor. I am an, a pre-seed and seed, so just to preface that, happy to answer any, any, any and all questions on how we work. And also the structure of our fund is about 80% of our limited partners run top global funds. Um, so we have GPs or the fund itself from like Y Combinator and, and Techstars and um, first, round, or, uh, first Round and Foundry Group and all these you know top global funds. Um, and then the idea is we do the pre-seed and seed and we help these companies get prepared to raise international capital. Uh, or, or be acquired by international uh, corporations, et cetera. So happy to talk about that process uh, and anything we look for in the pre-seed and setting them up for success down the road. Fantastic. Um, so my first question is, how should founders go about finding or courting investors? Yeah, I would say, and you know, a lot of, a, a lot of founders, when we first start working with them, like in the pre-seed and seed, um, before they have the big sexy name, names on their cap table, even before they have, you know, the domestic um, big guys on their cap table, even, you know, we're coming to companies as maybe their one, one through three first investor, like either the first, second or third investor, including angels and, and institutionals. And I can say that um, at the beginning, the, the founders are afraid to reach out without already knowing somebody. And sometimes that can be entirely prohibitive and literally stop them from progressing in their round because they just don't have those connections. And in order to get access to the warm intros, you need to have the connections. If you don't have the warm intros, you're stuck. And so I just wanna say first and foremost, 
um, with me and my network and the way that I started, I had none of these contacts. I say this on all the panels that I'm on. My mom was in the military for 23 years. My dad's a pastor in Nigeria, no business connections. And this network was started through LinkedIn DMs, through email DMs, meaning one person asking them for intros, et cetera. So started from scratch. And I just want that to be very clear to everyone. As long as you can add value and, and thought leadership, you can reach out to people on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Instagram. It doesn't really matter. Like, fortunately, COVID has democratized access to outreach and information sharing. And so as long as you are adding value and can be per and you, the content that you're sharing is useful, people will track what you're saying. People will retweet, follow and be receptive to your DMs. Um, I'd say uh, I, I respond to my Twitter DMs and maybe 1% of the people I've actually met in person. I'd say of our um. portfolio fun, maybe 50% of them we met in person before we made the investment. So like it's very common to develop a relationship with a prospective investor before you've actually ever met them in person and allowing yourself to reach out and develop that relationship without waiting for the warm intro. So just to get that off the off the, the table. And then and when it comes to the actual courtship process, um, as you mentioned before, the doing your research is so important. So yes, thinking strategically, like you were talking about with a, if you're raising a, as a healthcare startup and you're looking for, do you want pharmaceuticals to be in, involved in the round? Do you want you know strategic health tech investors or biotech investors? Being thoughtful about the type of investor and of course, thinking strategically. So for us, when, when we're putting rounds together in the very early pre-seed and seed stage space, we are thinking of investors not just as capital sources, but also as biz dev and expert operators. So what I mean by that, so think of your team and think of you as a founder and what do you guys have internally? Maybe you already have all the answers because you have people who've worked in the industry for you know 50 years or, or what have you, or maybe you already have all the later stage fundraising connections, or maybe you have all the corporate relationships that you need to expand your business, or maybe you don't. And so when you're thinking of investors you want to raise from, it's not just about the capital, it's about the additional value add. So yes, you want the strategic investor, but what does strategy mean to your specific business? So I like to, again, break it down into three buckets. Are these business development? So are uh, if you find an investor, and maybe they formerly worked in the sector where you are targeting customers, either on the B2C side or the B2B side. They can help you after they've closed the investment, they can help you close more deals. So be thoughtful about that and the type of investors who can work strategic, strategic with, strategically with you for business development and market expansion. The second one is uh, strategic operators. So not just today, maybe you have certain uh, uh, certain sort of uh, acquisition problems, customer acquisition problems today, or maybe you have certain sort of product focus issues today, but think of when you actually do hit your series A and series B, think about the growth stage. What type of investors are you going to need inside your business to advise you on your expansion? So as you're growing, so yes, of course, today, look for those guys today, but also tomorrow and the day after. As you guys grow, what type of strategic investors can help you from today and onward? That's the best type of investor. So somebody maybe who's scaled a business before and can advise even on the you know, pre-seed and closing your first customers and, and pricing and revenue models, et cetera, but then maybe can help you to your Series B and negotiating contracts and, and, and figuring out expansion and add potential mergers and acquisitions, et cetera. So thinking of those types of people who've sort of seen the 360 life journey of, of being a founder. And then the last one are deep pocketed investors. So to, you can find these in two types. One is corporates. So you can get a strategic investment. So like the Stripe to Paystack acquisition, um, that was a strategic investment before it became an acquisition. So you wanna be thinking about strategic investors who may go on if all things go well and, be, and acquire your business. You should be thinking about that from the earlier stages. The other things are sometimes growth stage funds have small pools of capital where they can do angel checks, or a lot of them have scouts or venture partners. A scout or a venture partner is just somebody who's not full-time working at the organization, but it's like an entrepreneur who on their, who's successful in their sector and has vertical expertise, and on their side may source some deals and wanna write like a 25 or 50K check on behalf of this growth stage fund. It's essentially like a feeder vehicle. It helps them keep track of what's happening on the, in the ecosystem. So by the time they, hit, they get to scale, um, or the businesses get to scale, they already have a relationship with them. So going around to those growth stage funds that you may want as your series A or series B lead and maybe seeing if they have some capital for a growth stage or, or for a, a strategic investment. This is if you're coming in and you're, you're having starting these conversations from pre-seed and seed. Um, I'd, I'd say the other thing and most important thing in co importing investors 
So what I want to see are a number of things. And, and firstly, that you've done your research and being uh, paying acute attention and remembering the fact that every interaction and everything that you do shows that the, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And every interaction is a data point on you. And so when you initially reach out to an investor, if you are outreaching and you've done no research and you have no idea the background or the type of deals that this found or that this investor has done, and then you're starting the conversation by asking them these questions, that's going to show this person probably doesn't do a whole lot of research when they're working. I wonder if they're doing the same thing before their, their business development meetings, you know, before the team meetings, et cetera. So that doesn't set a good precedent. So something very simple to take you five minutes to do is literally go onto their website and go onto LinkedIn. Typically, investors show the companies they, where their board members or the, the investments that they've made historically, um, or you can check their Twitter, et cetera, to get a feel for the type of investments that they that they do and the type that they've specifically done. And if you can say, hey, where are the X for this market? Or I see that you've done this company, or you've made this investment, here's a similar one in, in this local market. Because that also helps them put two and two together. And it's like you become a thought partner as opposed to somebody on the other side of the table that's trying to pitch at them. Uh, those are really good answers. And I think, you know, one of the major points you've made um, that I've picked up is just about being strategic, being strategic with your outreach, um, being strategic in thinking about what information you can gather about prospective investors and then using that information um, to provide value and create some sort of partnership, some sort of synergy. Um, and the most interesting thing is that you mentioned at the beginning um, that really sort of resonated with me is about the fact that, you know, you can't win the lottery if you don't buy tickets. So that fear of reaching out to people because you don't know them means that you're not buying the ticket in the first place. Like if you buy a ticket, no matter what, there's a chance that you're going to win the lottery. But if you don't buy the ticket at all, you can't be sitting down in your house with no ticket and they'll announce your name that you've won the lottery. It's impossible, right? So um, just being able to get over that fear of uh, cold outreach and, and um, reach out to people. And I think one thing that I've learned through my entrepreneurial journey is sometimes um, I meet somebody randomly um, and it turns out that I actually know somebody that the person knows. Um, so we're all sort of six degrees of separation away from each other anyway. So there are commonalities um, that we can sort of, with a lot of research, there are commonalities that we can find with almost anybody. Um, so that's always a, a great thing to bear in mind when um, you're trying to court founders or um, when you're trying to court investors or reaching out to investors. Great answer. Thank you very much for that. My second is what metrics should founders be keeping an eye on um, when they've raised their seed and they have a series A or a sort of later round in view? What kind of things that should they be keeping an eye on um, as, as founders in the process of building their product, finding pr product market fit and perhaps after product market fit as well? Absolutely. Um, I'd say... Uh... You know, this is this is really our sweet spot is helping sort of identify and, and target product market fit, um, helping guys uh, target their initial users, figure out really what value that they're adding, um, figure out like where in the market they sit. So I can say um, when founders come to us and this is B2, B2B and B2C, so I'm going to talk about the two the two different sides of the table. Um, B2B, for those who, who don't know, B2B means business to business, and that means um, you have a technology company that's providing solution, solutions for other businesses. B2C means uh, uh, business to consumer, so it means you have a technology company that's providing sol solutions for um, individual people in society. Um, B2B2C is you sell to another business who that, whose products then go to individual consumers, and you may have a relationship or be providing services to both the business and the end consumers. Um, so on the B2C side, I'll start with that. So one of the first conversations that we're having with a founder, um, of course, I want specificity, specificity around who your target customer is. A lot of people will be like, we're targeting women in Africa. And I'm like, <laughs> It's a really big market. Are you sure that somebody from the age of, you know, three or five is going to be using the same technology tools as somebody who's, you know, 80 or 90? So, so get really, and then also consumer demographics. Somebody who earns 20K a month Naira is going to be desiring the same technology tools and having the same consumer preferences and habits as somebody who earns, you know, 2 million a month. 
And so being really thoughtful, especially from day one of targeting, finding your, with specificity, your niche consumer. This is going to be like the, your, your version 1.0 and for whom you, you build your initial product. You really just want to solve the problem phenomenally for this core group of people and develop a, a community and people and brand champions, people who love your service and solution so much that they're going to tell other people about it and they're going to help you grow your business organically. And one of the, one of the, 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 a few of the most important things to be thinking about, like if I sit with a founder and they haven't thought about these specific metrics or these specific terms, I'm going to be really concerned because the most important thing you as a technology founder, the most important thing, a B2C technology founder, the most important thing is that you're building something people love. And if you don't have acute, acute understanding of what these people need in order to love your product, and if you also don't have an acute understanding of how to track what Absolutely. loving your product really means, then you're not able to, you, you can't hit a target you haven't identified. So be Correct. really specific about identifying your target and then hit that. So we have initial conversations with founders. Some of the first things we ask are, what are, your, what are your key metrics? It can be revenue, it can be customer growth, it can be MRR, that's monthly revenue. It can be AR, it can be annual revenue. It can be churn, it can be retention. So I'll go over some of these some of these metrics. And regardless of what your top two to three metrics are as an organization, the ones that you're acutely focused on, you also need to have a clear knowledge at any point in time, any investor conversation of what your monthly recurring revenue is, of what your annual recurring revenue is, of what your churn. So like how many customers are you losing in a month? How many customers are you retaining in a month? How many customers are you gaining in a month? And how long do they last? What is the lifetime value of the LTV, lifetime value of each customer? What is that lifetime value? So like the total money you'll make in your relationship with one customer relative to the CAC, which is customer acquisition cost. So how much does it cost you to get that customer versus how much are they going to spend with you and how much revenue are you going to make per customer? If those numbers don't make sense, like if your CAC, the cost of acquiring customer is more than or similar to the lifetime value, like the total value you'll get from the customers, your product from day one doesn't make sense and you need to rethink your model and rethink your offering. And so um, these are just some of the churn, retention, AR, MRR, and, and especially paying attention to, if this is more of a consumer tech app, you're gonna wanna focus on DAU and WAU. So that's daily active users and weekly active users. And that's how many times, like how sticky is your product? How many times a day are people using it? How much time, it, like how many hours? So like how, how many times a day is in, I, I log onto the app five to 10 times a day. That's amazing. Versus how many, how much, what amount of time? Like Netflix, I'll probably only log into Netflix once a day, but maybe I'll be on the app, I'll, I'll be on the app for three hours or an hour or 45 minutes or whatever it is. So these are core, depending on what your product offering is, there are some tools that it doesn't really make sense for a user to log in and be on for three to five hours. Like with Instagram, it's probably much more important, or I mean, I, I, I would say for, for being socially conscious, um, if we were solely looking at this lens from social consciousness, <laughs> um, people regularly log in, so check the app, you know, 10, 20 times a day versus spending five hours e at each time period. Of course, it's, it's optimized for both, but as a socially conscious business, we would like to look at it through the lens of just, you know, quickly logging in and out. Um, so here are some of the, those are some of the main, most important metrics on the, on the B2C side. On the B2B side, so at the beginning, I'd like to know what are your sales cycles? So how long do you think it's going to, and, and at the beginning also, it's okay to have conversations with investors and be at a point where you're like, we're still identifying product market fit, but we have these initial indicators. And so that's, as I was talking about the key metrics, initial indicators can be the same or they can be different and they can give you indication of where product market fit may exist. As in, we see these people who have given us an MPS score, we're, we're rating their, their experience, or we've asked these people to pre-order, or we've sent out surveys to understand and, and for them to pre-book. Of course, everyone is gonna say, oh, I love your product, I'll pay all the, all the money for it in the world. What really matters is, are they willing to put in their credit card information or debit card information? Are they willing to like, actually make a formal booking or engage on the platform or make some com some tangible commitment that is an offering of something to receive that value. So on the B2B side, want to be thoughtful about 
sales cycle, want to be so thoughtful about how you're going to acquire customers, want to be most thoughtful about how you're going to compete in the market. Um, and and who are your key players internally? Like who do you, your internal champions have to be in order for you to close the deal? If you have a great product, that's amazing. But if you don't know that you have to actually be engaging with the CTO and that has to be your internal champion or the chief marketing officer, or like you need to know what department inside of an organization you need to sell to in order to close the deal. And you need to have a, 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 a proper understanding, of course, the customer, of course, you have your strong understanding of the customer, which is the business itself, but also the person internally who needs to champion your product in order to close the sale. So those are just a couple of the things to pay attention to on the B2B and B2C side. You know, I love the way that you divided it into B2C and B2B, because I think when founders in Africa want to start a business, a lot of people are focused on B2C. Why? Because, you know, my friend wants to buy Brazilian hair or my friend wants to buy a car or my friend wants to buy makeup or, you know, this is what they see every day. Um, and there's a lot of advantages to B2B businesses. Um, first of all, B2B businesses are not fashionable. So, you know, I'm not very big on the nightclub scene in Nigeria, but I know that there used to be something called 1125 on our law. And then all of a sudden people were not going there anymore. And then now it's Quilox. And now Quilox is not cool anymore. Now it's somewhere called library. And, you know, it changes. And B2C customers sort of move with fashions and something's not cool and something is cool. And, you know, that's um, sort of one issue with B2B customers that they move on pretty fast. Um, mm -hmm. If they didn't, then, you know, would still be using MySpace or uh, what other thing? High Five was also cool at one point. We moved away from it. Now Facebook isn't cool anymore. Everybody's on Snapchat. So um, I think, you know, thinking about um, B2C versus uh, B2B is really important. Um, and I think also another problem with B2C customers is that they can be broke. Like they actually might not just have the money to buy your service, whereas B2B customers <laughs> always have money. Being thought, thoughtful about market volatility. So that's also why we encourage companies to be Pan-Africa or when they're on the B2C side, thinking about what markets or even on the B2B side, when you're looking at your, assuming that you want to be in a Pan-African business, what, like, of course, you're going to look at and, and anticipate that you're building a product or service where there are similar consumer demographics and a similar need across other key markets. But when you're thinking about your market expansion plan, of course, like what's the easiest market to, to conquer next, et cetera, but be really thoughtful about when there is market volatility, because there will be, we're building in Africa, when there's extreme growth in these respective markets, there will be volatile contraction periods, et cetera. We've seen it, it happens every two to four years, it's just life. So being thoughtful to make sure that you are not concentrating your business in a bunch of consumer markets that will hit volatility and drop at the same, at the time. same time. And so what we think about that is looking at the strength of the currency, looking at the historical inflation, and also looking at the GDP breakdown. Because one year oil prices go down and it's say, you know, 80% of X country's economy, oil prices go down, what's going to happen locally? Versus another that's maybe a logistics or export fo or agri export focused con uh, country and oil prices go down, what happens to that country? And so just being thoughtful of, on some of those global macros when you're thinking about market expansion as well. Not just like, oh, I have a friend in Ghana and who knows the Minister of Finance and so I can get this regulatory license, blah, blah, blah. Like be thoughtful and strategic about your expansion. Absolutely, that's super, that's actually super important. Um, also B2B businesses, their customers don't tend to go broke as much. So they, if they need your product, they need your product. No matter how poor a company is, you probably need to have Microsoft Word and PowerPoint to survive. And these are not the best products. They're just products that, you know, are sticky and the switching costs are high and there's no real alternative and you just have to pay every year. Like we pay every year for Microsoft and we have the whole Microsoft 365 package because we don't really have a viable alternative. If I send a document to you in another sort of software, aside from Microsoft Word, it might be difficult for you to open the document. So over time, people have just gotten stuck with Microsoft and people, companies, B2B, Companies are extremely lazy. Once they have your software, even if there's a superior software, it just takes a long time for them to make the decision. There's multiple stakeholders. It's really difficult for them to change their software. Um, even like my company is not a multi-billion dollar company, but the journey of having to change our accounting software 
is so difficult that we've stuck with it for so long because, you know, having to change it and having to get 10 years of historicals onto another piece of software and having the migration and having the learning curve for all of the accounting team is just so much. So think about B2B versus B2C and which one suits um, what you want to build, but don't neglect B2B. That's one thing. B2B, B2B businesses are powerhouses, and I feel like a lot of young entrepreneurs go to B2C because, you know, that's what they're familiar with, that's what their friends want, that's what they see every day. Um, but there's there's a lot of money in, in B2B as well, and I'm glad that you made um, the sort of you made the delineation between the metrics to look at for B2C businesses and B2C business and um, B2B businesses as well. Third and, question. And that, so go on. A note on that. Something to be thoughtful of. Of course, you know, um, a founder shouldn't try to, you know, retrofit their business to capitalize on B2B versus B2C. Like you choose one and then focus on that. And from the beginning, you should have assessed the market to understand can this scale, is this sustainable or not? But some, what I see a lot of go-to-market, so go-to-market is like your initial, when you're launching the product strategy, like what, to get, gain your first customers and get out there for the first time. I see a lot of guys focus on B2C initially um, because B2B can have longer sales cycles. So if you are sort of maybe having some service element of it, so either you're providing a service initially to the businesses that you want to target, and that also helps you get to know them a little bit better. You get to understand their pains, develop a relationship, have points of data where they can say, hey, these guys had the service and were able to execute. It is distracting, so don't do too much of it. But I see like when, especially in a down market like this, where capital raising is a little bit more difficult, or maybe when people don't want to raise, because you know I know this is about fundraising, but not everyone needs to fundraise, <laughs> like not right for everyone. Um, having the services or having some element of B2C that converts into a B2B um, longer term play or having some sort of two part revenue stream. If you have m too many lines of business and too many revenue scenes, streams, like more than two, max more than three, that's a, a turn off for us. Like if you, if, oh, we make money this way and this way and this way and this way and you're a pre-seed company that's just launched and you're like have, doing five to 10 things. No, just focus on one thing. Ideally, you have one line of revenue and you have one go-to-market strategy and you have clarity around, I need this much money to focus on B2B exclusively and get me 24 months so that my product can be finished and I can have sustainable revenue to get us to the next phase. So being thoughtful about those things, but it, just a couple tweaks and tips where, while we're operating in a down market. Perfect. Um, my next question is, what are your views on boards? I mean, I am in the pre-seed and seed. And so um, we uh, typically when we're coming in, founders don't even have a board. Um, the, the concept of formalizing a board is something like in the far off distance, one day we'll have, you know, and so they just mm -hmm. have advisors to start. And maybe give like a small um, uh, equity percentage, like a fraction of a percent to a few strategic advisors who are really active in the initial phases alongside their investor. Um, but certainly uh, the information, right? So separate from a board. So uh, I'll, I'll leave the board conversation for the, for the later stage Series A investors where that's an essential part. But for us, we still require all the same information rights, no transfer of assets, sort of um, uh, general reporting, um, having the structure of what a board would look like and the expectations of what that would look like uh, without having it formalized necessarily. Um, so what I mean by that and some things for founders to keep in mind and be thoughtful about from the early stages, because what you don't want to do is you get to Series A and then you're trying to institutionalize and you have a bunch of processes and systems that you haven't even thought about before and it's a total cultural shift from your company and then you might have to fire half your people because they're used to doing things one way and can't really adjust to the institutionalization. Like that screws a lot of people over. And even for us, we've definitely had growing pains of where we had some scrappy team members who were really good at the sort of startup phase of a venture capital firm. But then when it comes to institutionalization and like LP correspondence, like investor correspondence and reporting, et cetera, it's just not the right it just doesn't convert so mm -hmm. um something to think about from the beginning stage and that you want to have in place and that can be mutually beneficial because don't just put in these systems and you're like oh one day i'll institutionalize and one day it'll be valuable for some person no make sure that you're setting up systems that are always mutually valuable bottom line always needs to needs to net positive in value it's creating for you as a founder and your business and what i mean by that is having monthly or quarterly checkup calls with a few key strategic advisors, it causes you to one, 
take a step back and reflect on the business as a whole and think about my next couple months because you have this this group that you have a presentation that you have to present to. Hey, this is where we are with our traction. This is what's happening. It's just really important to have thought partners who've done it before, where you can bounce ideas off of them and then take the time to think macro. Because otherwise, you're going to be in the weeds, problem solving, and you might find you've taken a hundred steps to the right when you actually were supposed to take a a, a, a left at the junction. And so. Um, with that, monthly or quarterly advisor calls with maybe three to four people. Don't make it 10, don't make it 15, don't make it a huge thing, but just a couple key people who are really, who have vested interest in your own success. And even thinking about the board and who you want on, on your board, make sure a couple of things, as well as the advisors, like who start as advisors, and maybe even con they, those advisors can convert into board members. Like if you wanna be super strategic, Make sure that those advisors at the beginning where you're checking in and, and showing your progress and growth, maybe they're part of growth stage investment firms. So you can build a strong relationship and gain them as allies so they have vested interest in your success. And you come to that Series A and they're relevant. They're not just like, oh, we do like infrastructure in Kansas. And you're like, oh, I'm pre-seed health tech in Lagos. You know, make sure that it's still strategic and that they have value to, to add for you from day one to day 100. Um, but be Try to be as strategic and thoughtful about like how these guys can grow with your business over time. Um, I'll stop there. That makes a lot of sense um, and thank you so much. I mean, I think the key sort of phrase that you've used from question one to question three is all around strategy and intentionality. Um, and I think, you know, really being able to think about things and giving yourself the space um, to think about what you'll need in the future, in three months time, in four months time, in one year's time, um, from the questions about boards to the questions about um, sourcing and inviting and courting um, to the questions about metrics is all, all about really taking time to think about these things um, before sort of uh, jumping in. Um, so we're going to move to the next section now. So thank you so much, Maya. Um, I've learned a lot. I'm sure um, everybody else on the call has learned a lot and it's been really, really great chatting to you and see you soon. See you. Thank you so much. Hi, great. This was a really, really engaging session. Thank you so much, Maya. Thank you, Dr. Ola. Thank you so much. Honestly, there are lots. There was just a lot. A lot was coming out of there. And I really believe that everybody has had something like if we were to end this webinar at this point, I guess it's been worth it, right? But um, there's still a lot more. Actually, there's a whole lot more. So we're just going to go straight into it. We'll be calling. So again, this is a webinar slash a book launch, right? So we do have a reviewer, a book reviewer. She's going to be giving us her deep insights as well as reviewing, giving us a review of the book Journey to Series A. And we'll call her up right away. But before then, I'll just give a real brief intro into our speaker, her name is Natalie Colby, and I'm sure, again, she's not new to most of us in this industry. Natalie Colby currently serves as managing partner at Noskin 22, and she's also a board member at Upstream Telecommunications, Sigma Pensions, and Software Systems. She serves, she served as board member at Tracker Connect. She joined Actis in 20, 2003, sorry, from Sebi Securities where she worked as an equity analyst and later served as partner and head of private equity in 2016 across all regions and sectors, encompassing Latin America, Africa, and Asia. She started her investment management career at Investec Bank in 1999, where she was part of the team that established Investec Asset Management Investor Center. Like I've said previously, all of our speakers today are fully competent to deliver on this topic. So please, ladies, gentlemen, welcome, help me or join me, welcome Ms. Natalie Colby to take the stage. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marion. Um, I, I, I don't know if I can quite agree with your, uh, your assessment that I'm fully competent to do a book review because I will stay upfront that I've never done a book review. <laughs> this is the <laughs> first one I'm doing. Uh, so I might be doing it completely wrong, but um, obviously I've been in the investment world for for over 20 years. So that that I can talk on. But my job here today is is to do a, a book review specifically. So I will do my best to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm really I'm not going to to spend the time regurgitating you know, everything that has been said before. I think there's been a lot of 
of um, I mean, obviously Ola did a very good job of talking through the 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 book um, and did a good summary of that. And obviously um, Maya has brought some of those topics to life. So I'm not going to to talk too much about the the you know the specific content of the book, but but really just to to talk about um, uh, you know to try and, and do a real a real book review. And I'll I'll cover two topics in that. I mean, just first of all, just talk about the style of the book and um, and secondly about about the, the content and specifically about some reflections on on that content rather than then as I say you know going through it again because I think that's been done very thoroughly um, I mean I think just firstly just to to talk about the the style of the book I mean I think if any of you read this it, this, this is a really easy and quick read I mean I, I really love the conversational style of it and it makes it easy for anybody to be a, to be able to read this it's um it's void of of the technical jargon you're not being bombarded by a kind of technical slang and it is very easily explained if there is slang or if there's jargon that needs to be kind of highlighted um i think i think the book does that very well and in a very easy way so it's not it, it comes across more as in, in a very conversational style, more as a kind of casual chat that you're having with a friend rather than kind of a textbook, which which can get very heavy and boring. So I think that that was just, I think, as, as I said, it's a very easy, easy book to read. I think that the, the style, it's, it's clear, it's concise and, and it's accessible um, and it makes complex concepts easy, easy to understand and very relatable for for readers. So whether you you're a first time um, you know, investor, or whether you're someone that that has invested and, and you, you've kind of been on this journey before, I think this this strikes a very good balance between being informative on the one hand and not overwhelming you, you know, with with with, with technical um, difficulties on on the other. I think you know, I've outlined how the book is structured. I think it's structured in a, in a very logical manner. You know, starting with the fundraising process and taking you through some very practical, um, you know, the the journey very practically all the way through to actually, you know, kind of closing the deal, the deal at the end. Um, and what I particularly liked about the book is that it provides very logical um, and valuable nuggets, uh, practical, actionable advice. Uh, and I love the inclusion of things like cheat sheets, um, you know, uh, you know, checklists, you know, Ola mentioned the, the forwardable blurb and, and a very kind of, you know, very engaging way on how you can, you know, use those templates um, when you are doing your, your Series A investment. So I really enjoyed the style and I think it's a very enjoyable and quick and easy read um, that I think can get you up to speed very quickly, regardless of where you are in your knowledge of, of the sector and in your in your startup journey. I mean, then on the content, look, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm not going to comment specifically or, or go through this in a huge amount of detail, but maybe just dive in on some of the aspects that I thought were were very um, were, were very helpful. I mean, I think there's there's uh, the, um, the book starts off with, you know, the what is a Series A? I mean, I think that's kind of one of those questions that has many answers. I think if you have to ask. Uh, you know, everybody on this call, you know, what's your definition of a Series A? You'll, you'll get, um, you know, completely different answers and I think that that sheet that that's in the that's in the book that that kind of gives some outline as to what a series a could look like or should look like or might look like I think it's a very helpful guideline it obviously isn't it isn't the the bookends I think you know just um you know I think it's a guideline rather than an absolute so when you are looking to to fundraise you, you might tick you know a few of the boxes and, and really not tick at all, some of the other ones. It doesn't mean to say you you aren't a series A. It just means to say that you know you, you you don't tick all the boxes, and no one will tick all of those boxes. I think it's unlikely that you'll find any deal that that you'll be able to go through that checklist and go tick 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 tick. I think it's a good a good um uh, you know it, it, whichever one you tick the most in is probably the one that you should be falling in. And I think if you are struggling to define it, and I know a lot of a lot of startups do struggle to define, you know, am I pre-series A, am I seed, am I series A, am I extension, all that. And it, and it, it it's important and it isn't because investors will make up their own mind. But it does, you know, some as, as a fund, you know, a fund, some funds will be a series, a seed fund. Others will be a series A fund and, and you know, a series A might not look at a seed fund. And then you think, oh, well, I might be falling between the cracks here. Um, so I think that it, it's a good place to take advice and don't, feel like you're overwhelmed and that you can't find the answer because it's not that obvious. I mean, even for us as investors, we sometimes struggle to to put to put um, investments in boxes and we shouldn't be putting them in boxes. I think it's it's really just a guideline, but it is one that I think you can take advice from and definitely speak to your your seed investors or your early stage investors and speak to prospective investors. What would they want to see for it to be considered as a Series A? Um, 
and get that get that input before you kind of put a put a tag on it. And um, the other the other part of the of the content of the book that I really thought was was very powerful and very relevant is um, you know, Ola really brings out the this this power of of relationships. I mean, and um, I think Maya spoke about that as well. The power of networking, um, and I, I love the quote. You know, first and foremost, the Series A fundraising journey starts when you close your seed round. Um, that is absolutely true, and frankly, I'd say it probably even starts before that. It starts from when you start. Um, you know, who you get into your cap table is critical from day one, uh, because they will be very influential on who comes into your cap table going forward. So I think be be very intentional about who your your seed investors are, who and you know who you want to bring in as as your Series A. As so for our fund, we we do from Series A and beyond. Um, and before the first DD call that we make is to the other investors in 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 the investments. So before and often before you as a Series A um, company are speaking to us, we've already had the conversation with your investors. Um, so the the investors, your seed investors, the investors that you have in your cap table are absolutely critical because they are going to be um, you know your champions in the market or not, as the case may be. Um, so you really want to pay pay attention to those seed investors. You want to be giving them a very clear a very clear information, be very upfront with them. Make sure that you meet the targets that you tell them you're going to meet. They're going to be very grumpy with you if if you say one thing and you don't deliver on it, and they're not going to be that um, flattering when a, a Series A investor says, well, what, what do you think of this company? And say, look, they missed all of their targets and what they told us they were going to do, they didn't do, right? You, you don't want that conversation happening. Um, and I think, you know, this this, this point around, um, you know, newsletters is is, is very, it's, it's quite a nice way to keep investors um, involved, you know, and 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 keep keep you front of mind. Um, again, like for us as a Series A investor, we, we come in at the Series A, um, you know, we will have conversations with seed, with, with at the seed round because we want to learn about the company and understand it. And if you're pinging us with a relevant newsletter, you know, uh, please don't overload our, our inboxes. But if you're pinging us with a, a relevant newsletter that says, look, this is what we've done with real information, not just you know, like an airy fairy information, um, you know, we go, OK, well, this company is, is getting the traction. They said what they were they're doing, what they said they would do. Uh, we're going to pay attention to this company when, when they come up for their Series A. So I really like that that um, suggestion of a, of a newsletter that that's relevant. Um, the other the other topic that I thought was was is absolutely key and 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 Ola spoke about it in quite a lot of detail in her opening remarks is about preparation um and you know you that this again a quote from the book saying fundraising process should be planned 12 months uh, when you have 12 months of runway left absolutely anything pre anything shorter than that and you are putting your back up against the wall and you'll end up taking a deal that you don't particularly want so i, I cannot stress the importance of planning and preparation enough in fundraising Momentum is your friend. Um, you you want to get in there. You want to get in front of an investor. You want them to be excited about your deal. They want you want them to feel like they're going to lose out if they don't move fast enough. Um, and you want them to take it through their process quickly. If it drags through an, an investment process, the chance of it getting turned down is much more likely than if it's quick and seamless and you and you get through it quicker. So, I would say you know making it um, easy for the investor to do their work is really, really important. So this point around the data room, I think, cannot be stressed enough. I mean, don't put a lot of rubbish in the data room, but making it organized and relevant. And I, I think there's a there's a cheat sheet um, or a, a checklist in, in, in the book that I think is is super helpful and, and you know, classifying it and grouping it so that people can you know focus on where they want to go, I think is um is 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 really important as well. You know, investors get lots of pictures you know as, as an investor as a fund we're getting stuff coming through to us all the time you want to stand out and making it easy for me to digest your information is going to make me want to engage then if you're making me work really hard and and, and fuzzing my brain out right? i'm just going to be like oh this is too hard and you just move on to the next one so i think you know just really putting emphasis take your time to make sure that you're prepared i think cannot be be stressed enough um and the boring topic of compliance, and I think it's great, you know, that um, that Anna pulled this out as a as a topic because nobody really wants to talk about this. I mean, it's like the really boring thing that nobody really wants to talk about. It is probably one of the most important topics that you can have. And people always say to me, oh, you know, when you're looking at it, what is one of the most important topics? And, you know, people talk about momentum and growth and your investors. Yes, yes, yes. But compliance is critical. Uh, you know, yes, the market might affect your growth rates. 
yes, you know, the, up or down, you, you can't affect the market. But what will absolutely kill your business is a compliance issue. Um, and you, you, we've seen it, unfortunately, we've seen it with some of the, the headlines that have come out of the African continent, not just the African continent, it's come out of all of all markets. Um, if you've got a compliance issue in your business, you are blacklisted, you will not attract investors, and it's a, it's a relatively easy thing to get right. So I, I really think, you know, this, this point that, um, that Ola brought out in the book about getting the, 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 the compliance right is absolutely critical. Making sure that your board minutes are, 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 are well documented, that they're in the data room, you're not hiding anything. People read through those board minutes, they check what's the conversation the board, the board is having. Having an independent director on your board can also be, you know, a, a, a good sign of, and a true independent director, not your friend who's, you know, kind of down the road that you want to bring on, a real independent board, a board member. Um, and this, this this topic about audits and and, and financial, um, you know, the, the, the thoroughness of the financial statements is, is key. And obviously having one of the big four is helpful. Um, it doesn't necessarily say that, you know, big four equals compliance. We know we've seen that, that that's not always the case, but it is an easier, um, it is definitely, it, it makes investors feel a bit more easier if one of the big four are, are auditing. And I know they're expensive, but it, it, it can help ease the, the process as well. So, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to bring out those topics. Again, I think it's a it's a it's a great, easy, quick read. I think if you are going into your Series A, I definitely recommend you reading it because there, there's some very practical um, piece of, pieces of advice and valuable lessons that I think you can you can draw out of it. So I'll draw to a close there. Uh, thank you so much, Natalie. So I think everyone would pretty much agree with me that you've done justice to this topic. So like I said, I still stand by my statement that you were competent to deliver on this topic. So I think I won that bit. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Fantastic job. Really awesome. And um, we just wanted to throw this invite out to you. If you would want to join the panel session, you're perfectly free to join the panel session as well, because we're going right into that right now. And I will be inviting our panelists who will be joining us. I think they're both presently here right now. So they'll turn on the cameras and then we'll have a couple of questions which we will pass through um, from one panel, one panelist to the other, as well as questions which we have coming in from the audience. So it's really been a very engaging session. I do know that one of the key things that you spoke about, Natalie, was saying that um, it's pretty uh, like data room. It's it, you should not leave your data room messy. No, no, no. It should be pretty organized because. So yeah, because we're also in that space, we can also we can also relate with that, right? So yeah, data room and the importance of leaving your data room organized. Like there's a whole lot that is being discussed right here, right now, and there's more to come. So yeah, let me just really quickly um, do the intro, introduce our panelists. They have their videos on already. I will start with Mr. Andrew Furman. So Mr. Andrew has worked in the finance industry domestically and internationally. He has experience in both asset management and investment banking, including time spent at a Canadian single family office and as a vice president with JP Morgan. He's currently focused on frontier markets, early stage venture capital with an emphasis on sub-Saharan um, sub Africa pre-seed and seed stage deals. He has executed on 20 plus early stage deals in Africa. Again, competent. He is fully competent to speak on this topic. But before we have him start speaking to us, I would introduce Ms. Dami Lola Thompson as well. Now, Dami Lola Thompson currently serves as partner and co-founder at Diligence Africa. She's an investment professional with over 14 years of experience investing, building and executing strategies for VC funds and tech companies across global markets as a venture capital investor, entrepreneur, and operator. She's, a pas she's passionate about entrepreneurship and supporting and teaching entrepreneurs to build sustainable businesses. This is going to be one session you want to take a lot of notes. So I do have questions. Dr. Ola Brown, pardon me, Dr. Ola would also be part of the panel session. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce her anymore, right? Like I've done that earlier and she's been fully part of this webinar. So she will be part of the session and then we can have Natalie as well if she's willing to join us for the panel session. Right, so they're going to we have a couple of questions already outlined and then we have questions pouring in from the audience. So 
since we've had we've had Mary, I'm sorry I just realized that I'm the only non-CFA chatter holder on this panel oh. am I <laughs> oh no <laughs> I, I, I feel I feel like we should count a medical degree as as a medium superior to CFA like, Just my two cents. <laughs> really, I should just let you guys speak. Okay. All right. So that's a good one. So um, like I was saying, I think we've had we've had ladies, ladies, ladies talking to us and dropping a lot of really important things to note. So uh, we like to be gender focused. We don't want to be gender biased, right? So I think the very first question it wouldn't be fair if we direct it to Mr. Andrew Furman, and I'll just go ahead and run through that question. So first of all, let's start with you telling us about yourself, what you do, and the role you play in the ecosystem. Yeah, well, and first off, uh, thank you guys for having me again. Just just seeing the the book you've written, and uh, I think the help that that is going to be to both founders and VCs is really exciting. So I'm I'm really happy to be part of this. Um, and again, the the background, I I think I don't think I'm much more interesting than than what you said, but uh, yeah, I'm based here in the U.S. Um, longer story to how we got to doing what we're doing, but we essentially have a, a Pan Africa fund focused on very early pre seed. Um, Natalie just sort of chatted about this, but the reason I I add the qualifier of very early pre seed. Um, we're at kind of a stage in the venture ecosystem, I'd say, over the last five years where I don't really know what round titles mean anymore. I've met companies who have two or three million ARR raising a pre-seed, and I step back and I go, walk me through this. And they say, well, we've never raised money before. So anyway, I, I classify what we do as very early pre-seed. We want to sort of come in before traction. Um, we're pretty active uh, across Africa. So I think last year we did 32 or 33 deals. Um, my role's kind of been as a generalist. So um, I've invested in some very weird things. I've done music royalties. I've done litigation financing. And the reason I say that, I am not going to be the best person for leading a Series A or a Series B. That's not my expertise. What we are very good at and what we do in the ecosystem is we're very good coming alongside early companies. And the way I frame it is we try to eliminate the preventable ways that startups fail. Um, this is almost overly simplistic, but I think there are two ways startups fail, preventable, unpreventable. Can't do much about the unpreventable. But I think a lot of the errors we see are what I consider unforced errors. That's how I view us in the ecosystem. So I'm, I'm not the person you want leading a Series B and getting a mile deep. Uh, what we try to do is we view ourselves as an ecosystem builder. And I wouldn't say an accelerator, but we try to bring a lot of general capacity building alongside the very early founders that we back in, in, this, uh, in this area. So I ho hope that was helpful. Happy to give more detail, but that was just kind of a quick overview of who we are and what we do. Oh, I uh, maybe forgot to mention the name. Kaleo Ventures is, uh, is the, the firm that I'm a managing partner of. Oh, well, that was good. That was great. Yeah, that will do. And then, of course, you would have more opportunities to tell us even more because there are more questions that are, will be directed towards you. But let's just get Danny on the on the conversation. So um, let me direct this question to how when companies are raising their Series A, what do you think is the most important thing for founders to be aware of the most important thing. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dami Thompson. I currently run Diligence Africa and what we do is we provide due diligence services to investors. Um, we think there's a huge um, uh, market, you know, within the due diligence um, space where um, we provide deeper insights to investors, especially those that are out of the continent or those even, you know, present on the continent. Um, and we also provide startup advisory services to to um, to founders with regards to governance and compliance services, accounting services um, and fractional CFOs, uh, fractional uh, uh, services. Um, I think that one of the so in, in my sense, I think that there's no kind of most important thing. I think that there are several things that founders should think about as they raise series, uh, um, you know, um, series A financing. But I think that one of the, you know, kind of priority in terms of priority, I think that you think about your traction because that that is literally what gets any investor um, to move a needle and say, I want to give you money today. If your traction um, is not aiming towards, you know, the um, anything around a thousand, a hundred thousand dollars MRR, um, and they've seen consistent growth um, over a six month. And I think this was, this was something that Dr. Ola pointed out um, in her book, where there's a consistent growth over a six month to to twelve month period. Um, you just are not going to see any any um, any traction. It might also be that you know. Um, I think that we've seen situations where 
the founder raises a series A, there's not enough, you know, growth, um, but there's several things that, you know, that back it up. It might be a unique, um, a unique space. It might be an opportunity where there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of um, um, insights where, you know, a new insight comes up and then the founder has built something and then all of a sudden everybody wants to get in on the deal. There might be just, you know, kind of unique um, um, times or when um, a founder has been, you know, um, building for, for the longest time and all of a sudden um, there's an opportunity and we call that a window opportunity um, and then all of a sudden the startup seems very relevant and everybody wants to get in on the deal and then he starts to read the series A. Um, but if you're very intentional about what you're building and you know being very intentional about getting to a series A, I think that your traction is the most important thing. I think that um, also your team um, is one of the things that investors look at because several things can go wrong in a in in a um in a company. I think at Echo VC, so I used to work at Echo VC as an investor, and I think one of the things that um we came across was we had funded a Series A company um, six months into six months or two, you know, up to a year into the Series A funding, the business model changed. Um, and we're like, oh, yeah, so the business model changed and we're like, OK, is this something that they should have, you know, figured out before um, before raising the, 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 you know, the Series A? But um, I think the founders are very experienced. We had, you know, faith in the ability to execute. Um, the business model change and they also carried you know the investors along um so it wasn't just something that they did it was like you know what these are the things that we're seeing the market is changing we also think that it's necessary for us to kind of change um in line with what we're seeing in the market so they you know the the transition was pretty smooth um and i think that they were able to retain most of the the clients that they had um but i think that your business model, your business, you, you need to, to understand that your um, your business model is something that you need to have gotten at the time. Um, I think that with product market fit, and I know this was something that was mentioned in Dr. Ola's book, product market fit, sometimes it's CBC, some people don't have it. I think that you can consistently um, build and get um, decent revenues even to up to a series uh, to a series A funding, um, but your product might not have it, and you know you might not have it uh, product market fit. But I think that at the point where you you then raise a series A funding, um, that is something that you need to have figured out because many people will support you number one because they think that your opportunity is interesting because they think that your traction is great because they think that you're a great founder you have a great team um because they think that, that the market opportunity that you know for the space that you're building is also you know something that they're very excited about and they think that you're able to execute um within that opportunity so i think it's a it's a it's a whole different you know factors um i don't think that there's one kind of most important thing i think there's just maybe priority that you place um, across whatever um, um, whatever factors your 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 Series A funding. Thank you so much. I'm really interested. But um, while you were speaking, I guess you are engaging the audience, right? So someone has is is trying to pick on or has picked on something you said and has yeah. a question along those lines. And so the person said, "But Dami, we've seen firms raise money without 100k MRR. So how do yep. we explain that?" Yes, I think we've been seeing funds raise money with Series A funding with just 10K, 10K MRR. And I think that, um, again, this was like last year, two years ago, um, when investors had a lot of money needed to deploy. Um, and investors were, you know, just very excited about um, the startup opportunity globally. Um, I think that now, I think that things are changing. I think that people, I think that investors, let me use that word, investors are now more um if you if you if you have the, the opportunity to sit in front of an investor now, everything that they're talking about is your traction. I think that the era where investors just gave money without um, again, it also depends on who you are, right? Andrew uh, um, Adam Newman is raising you know a ton of money um, without some I mean, without a product. Um, there's so many people who are doing that. We've seen founders who have you know even been. Um, accused of um, fraud in the previous companies who raised significant amount of money. We're seeing that, you know, still happening even now. So I think that, again, it depends on the market. I, uh, um, uh, this was something that, you know, I, I, I keep saying to investors that when something happens on the African continent, um, there's a lot more stigma that gets attached to it than if it happened in the US or if it happened in Europe. Um, as African founders, we understand that there's a lot more scrutiny um, that we would face um, that will get you know um, um, spotlighted at you because you're an African founder. You're building from the for the continent. There's a lot more macro 
um, economics that will affect your product outside, you know, things like fraud or, found, or the founder decides that, you know what, he, he doesn't want to do this business again. So I think that you, um, all that is good. I think that focus on where you are as a founder, focus on your company growth. I think that the more traction that you show, the better for you, because then all the questions around, oh, how, how are you going to grow this business? Investors can already see. So it takes a lot, a lot of those questions away because you're already showing all the signs that this will be a great business. Um, but unfortunately, I think that as African founders and depending on also where you are, um, where you're based, you might not have the opportunity to raise on, you know, 5K MRR and raise a Series A funding at 5K MRR. Really great response. Thank you so much. Really great. And indeed, like you said, as an African founder, there's a lot more scrutiny on us, on you, because you're raising like it's, it's the continent of Africa. Thank you so much for that. And I do have a question also specifically directed to Andrew. So I'll just I'll just shoot that straight at you. So it says, um, hi, Andrew, for Christine. What metrics do you look for if there is no revenue? It, 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 it's a good question. So um, mm -hmm. this sort of goes back to, and I know again, Natalie pointed this out as well, but um, in the book, I think um, there's such a great job done of kind of what each stage wants to see. When I think about metrics or when I think about traction, I would encourage a founder and a VC to view those as slightly relative to the stage they're at. And so here's what I mean by that. When I'm looking at a, a pre-seed startup, um, I am actually less concerned with MRR because in a lot of ways, I view MRR as a lagging indicator. And actually, I think it was Maya that might've said this in her talk as well. What I'm, what I'm curious to do with a pre-seed startup is get with them very early on and think through what are the North Star metrics specific to that company? How I define a North Star metric is one, potentially two, maybe three numbers that we know are going to tell us the truth and are not going to lie to us. And what we'll know is if those numbers are improving, we know that MRR will follow. One of the dangers I've seen is generalizing what metrics work for all startups, because sometimes they are still good metrics, but they can lie to you. I'll give you a real example. Um, about a month ago, I was talking to a fintech company and I asked them what the North Star metrics were. And what they came back with is, well, what we want to see is um, uh, DAU. We want to see daily active users, and we know that, that that's going to point our company to, to success. What I pointed out is we're concerned with actually seeing AUM growth, not necessarily users, because there's not a flat fee. So what I pointed out to them was there could be a case where your MAU or DAU is going up a lot, but each one of those customers is putting in an inconsequential amount. And so you're going to hold this thinking, we're getting closer to product market fit. People love our product. And that's true, but that's not indicative of your success. So what I would say is when I look at metrics for a company or traction for a company, for pre-seed, I'm a little bit less concerned about MRR. That changes completely when we get to the seed round, where that to me is now, okay, you've had enough time. We should be seeing what should be a lagging indicator. But at pre I'm really wanting a founder to identify the MRR traction, but what are the leading indicators that we can track in real time that we know will point to that actual revenue traction by the seed stage? And so that's where I divvy it up is at this pre-seed stage, I'm really wanting them to figure out, is there a market? and prove that by the seed. By seed, I'm not really expecting product market fit. I'm expecting early signs of that, um, but it's a series A where you absolutely need to have product market fit, but each one of those stages should be looked at as, I, I think, as different types of traction and different indicators of that traction, if that makes sense. Sure, it makes sense. It makes a whole lot of sense. So just like you said, at pre-seed, you're not really, you're looking for signs of product market fit as against an actual Fit. So, and like you said, every stage has its own different dynamics. Really, really awesome. So, I'll just bring um, Natalie into the conversation and just ask her this direct this question to her. So, as a pre seed and seed investor, what do you think is the most important thing VCs should be aware of while guiding their companies through their Series A journey? Yeah, very, very, very good. We're coming in at the um, at the series A at the series A stage, right? So, so I'll I'll talk a little bit about that when when um, businesses are, are are coming to us. I think there's the the, the point that was made earlier um, that Maya made around where your revenue is coming from and not having 
a very confusing message, I think is is really, really important. I think people get a little bit excited about, you know, there's there's so much opportunity in front of you. Oh, we can do this and we can do this and, and we've got this revenue line and we, and we can have this. And as an investor, you're just like, oh. So I think just making sure that you're you're very clear about what your um you know where how you're making money and I think I, I love what what Andrew was saying there you know what are those two or three things that is going to get you to your MRR and how do you diligence that and, and just being really clear about that I mean even if there are kind of other aspects of of things that the teams are looking at I think to the investor just be very clear that this is that this is the the metrics that you look at and again like as Andrew said it's not ten it's three or four that drive your your revenue um. And, and and sticking to to that and not trying to you know oh we're going into this product oh and then we're going into this market and then we you know we, we're I think being very clear about that and and the, the traction on that is super important at, at that level the second one is is um, unit economics I mean I, I think we you know this is something that's been discussed on on many topics before but I, I think Andrew touched on this point you know we can it's kind of that vanity metric of oh we've got so many users but from a unit economics perspective you might have a hundred thousand two hundred thousand a million users but they're negligible from a profitable from from a profitability perspective they're actually draining and, and they're costing you money um rather than actually you know being being profitable so looking at that that traction that monthly traction that annual traction then looking at the product market fit I mean I think those are the two big metrics that we that we look at um you know coming into the into the series A and I think Dami was absolutely right I think anything less than a hundred thousand dollars um you know you're probably not at the series at the series a level and then you know the, the team i mean i know it's also something that gets we've spoken about all the time but it is really critical right i mean um who the the founding team is and it is a team and not necessarily a single founder obviously if it's a single founder that, that he or she is important but the team around them you know no business can be built by by a single person so you know really having having a look at, at who who's who's around that and then the, the other investors, right? Um, I mean, I, I, I made this point, and and Ola made the point in the book. You know, the the the, the other investors around the table are, are really important as well. And you know, I would say think carefully about it, it can be a positive, and it can also be a negative about bringing a strategic investor in. Um, you know, they it can be very enticing to have a, a strategic investor at your cap table, but they can also redirect your strategy in a way that you might not like it and influence your exits in a way that may, that may not um, you know maximize value either. So I'd, I'd I'd focus on those on those four four things at that stage. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you. Yeah, I do recall while we giving the review of the book, you did mention to pay particular attention to the investors that come on your cap table. I think you even did specify that. That should be something you should be particular about from the very, very beginning. Very important point there. Thank you so much. Um, I would, Dr. Ola, I will bring you in at some point, but I just thought I would direct this question to Dami. So in this high interest rate environment where it's more difficult to raise capital, what do you think has changed since the years of the VC boom, which started around 2020? Yeah, so I think that, and this was something that I, I had mentioned earlier, I think that a lot more um, investors have been a lot more diligent with the kind of companies that they're investing in now. I think that um, now there's there's a lot more scrutiny with, you know what, it's an interesting opportunity, um, but we need to know more. Um, how, you know, how long have you been doing this? Um, how much money have you raised? Um, where are you in terms of your growth? Um, what is, does your... Um, um, what does the future, you know, the, the, the next five years look like for this business? Um, but actually want to see a lot more traction. I think I'm, I'm beginning to see a lot of that. Um, I think that I'm also beginning to see with the kind of decline in, in venture funding, a lot more people are resorting to debt, you know, um, so venture debt. Um, I was speaking with the Silicon Valley Bank team a couple of weeks ago and asking them, you know, is Africa still on their radar taken into consideration what happened with the bank run? Um, they're still very excited about, you know, the venture debt. Um, um, lending that they used to do, they're still open to opportunities, you know, so if anyone has um, a viable business that they think that venture debts can take care of instead of raising, you know, as a um, in place of equity, um, the Silicon Valley Bank team, you know, are still interested. I'm happy to make introductions again, depending on the business. Um, but I think that, you know, that is one opportunity. I've spoken to a couple of also lenders um, on the continent who are also very open. They're beginning to see a lot more people come to them um, to raise debt in place of um, in place of equity. I think that I'm also beginning to see a lot more. Um, and this is not necessarily like 
companies that are going to Series A, but companies that are just looking for funding. So seed, pre-seed, um, pre-Series A um, are also relying a lot on, on angel investing. I think that we're beginning to see a lot more traction on the angel investment side. Um, with companies just, you know, going to angel investors and saying, um, this is, you know, this is what we're doing. We just need a, a bridge. Um, and Dr. Olad had a, um, um, a definition of a bridge round and a um, seed extension in her book. Um, and so a lot of, a lot more companies are beginning to take those kind of to the next milestone and we need, you know, we need some money. Um, we're currently working with some companies who are currently doing that. So I think that those are the different, you know, different things that we're seeing. More venture debt um, requests, more angel investment activities, um, more VC funding, but mostly on high growth, um, great traction companies, um, um, founders that, you know, have a lot of founders that investors have a lot of a lot of faith in and believe that can, you know, can execute and, and build a great um, a great business. So yeah, those are the, you know, the the things that I'm seeing. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, Dami. But somebody um, does have a question times that stirred up from what from your response. So they're saying, what could be the reason why some pre-seed investors turn down a pre-seed startup with up to 10K MRR? It might be for different things. It might just be that the investor just doesn't invest in that in that space. I think that different, you know, companies have different metrics. Sorry, different uh, funds have different um, metrics that they look at. You know, so even if you had up to 10k MRR and they just don't believe that the founder can execute, that could be a reason. It might also be that industry that um, some, you know, VC firms are, are sector agnostic, which means that they would invest in any sector. And um, some are very specific. You know, so Dr. Ola is fintech and healthcare um and um i think north skin 22 is, is um sector agnostic but again correct me if i'm wrong um so yeah so i think that different different you know vc funds have specific and i think that as a founder before you approach any vc fund that those, those are the kind of research that you want to do you need to do your homework because if you send an email to an investor and they are not investing in your sector um i was looking at uh, um, a vc fund yesterday and they only do artificial intelligence and machine learning um, companies. And if you went to them with a fintech company, it's like, what are you even doing in my email? So those are the things that you need to look out for. I think also um, when you reach out to an investor, look at their portfolio companies because you want to ensure that they haven't invested in a competitor, a competitor business. Um, I think that it would be to your detriment if that happens, because that means that um, they might prioritize one, you know, one startup over the other. So you, or you, um, and sometimes, you know, I've seen situations where investors will ask you to share data room um, and they already have, you know, a, a, um, a startup that um, they've invested in a very similar business. And unfortunately, things might happen that you might not be excited, excited about. Um, a couple of African founders have, you know, shared the stories about their experiences with, you know, investors that did the same thing. Um, so I think that you, you want to be careful who you're reaching out to, who you're sending your, you know, access to, to your data room to, um, and where you're, um, where you're pitching, you know. Um, I would say that, you know, the the best, um, for me, I think the best money that you can ever get is your customer money. I, I honestly would prefer companies that are bootstrapped because then when you show the traction, VCs will look for you. I always tell people that VCs will come to your doorstep, VCs will knock, VCs will beg to get into your company. The best, the best money you can get is your customer money. When you show traction, every other thing is irrelevant, honestly. Um, people will be like, oh, you know, he'll figure out the team, but the company is growing so fast and they're doing so well and everyone is using them. Everyone will be talking about you. Um, but if, unfortunately, you do need money to raise, I think that go to VCs, go to angels, um, look for debt funding, but also be, um, be intentional about who you're reaching out to. I think there's some questions around um, the the book. I don't know if this has been had answered. You know, we're also here for a reason. Dr. La, I want to help you sell your book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we're responding to them and we have been chatting back to them and we will address that at some point. Thank you so much. OK, so um, I do want to ask direct this to um, Andrew. So um, the question here is, what do you think the difference like what's the different what do you think are the differences between raising a series a fund then and raising a series a fund now and um this might tie into some of the question around what is the typical valuation at a series a 
So what do you think is the, are the differences between raising Series A fund then, raising Series A fund now? What's the typical valuation for a Series A? I think there's a bit of Nigerian yeah, English mm -hmm. here. So raising a Series A fund is not a fund, though. I think that it's just oh, a Nigerianism. Oh, 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 so, yeah. so I think they use the singular instead of plural. So they still mean raising Series A funds by yeah. startup. But um, yeah. I think there's a Nigerianism in the question that makes it uh, difficult. So it's a it's a Nigerian English thing, but it still means raising for a company, not actually raising a fund. But right. the way it came across, it's as if you're talking about a fund like no skin, but actually we some uh it's a Nigerianism not to pluralize um funding or fund, the word funds. <laughs> so it's still talking about yes. a company. And it, 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 it's such a good question. You know, the, the way I want to approach this, and I'm I'm hoping this is gonna be more helpful for everyone on the call, is is thinking about I would say what has structurally and systematically changed in the market. I've seen some commentary on fundraising in, um, sorry, I'm seeing, uh, Dami, can you hear me? I just want to be sure that. Yes, I can okay, hear okay. you. I think um, I my so I, I, I think I've seen some commentary, you know, encouraging founders to kind of buckle up for the next, you know, 12 or 24 months because things are hard in the market. And, and I don't want this to come off discouraging. I want it to come off as real. But what we saw last year, especially with interest rates, which again, I think are more symptomatic, um, but this is going to be a long time of being in this kind of environment. Um, being in a flat or rising interest rate environment for venture is incredibly different. And so as it ties into a Series A, I think there are a couple things. Number one, the kind of the easy low hanging fruit is VCs really want to see strong unit economics. Um, what I would say for myself is I'd go beyond that. I really want to see profitability. Um, I think, and I'm stealing this from a VC I like in the US, but profitability I think is a more achievable goal than a Series A. And what most founders don't understand, and this is the same whether it's in the US or in Africa or Southeast Asia, a pre-seed round um, is relatively easy to raise. And I would say a seed round is relatively easy as well. Uh, a Series A is a different beast. Pre-seed and seed you can raise based off of vision and well, we haven't seen the revenue yet, but this is sort of in process and we're having more conversations. When you get to a Series A, things become real. I don't wanna hear your story, I wanna see your traction. And the, the distinction I make is, if I talk to a company that is doing incredibly well, and I ask, how are you doing? What they're going to say is um, our MRR is 250,000. We've been growing 35% month on month. And I'm like 90% of the way done with my due diligence, right? The story makes sense. I'm excited about things. It's when people start giving me a lot of other information that I didn't ask for that flags go up to say something's not right. So if I ask, how are things going? How's your traction? And I get a five minute response back of, all these adjectives, I always encourage VCs and founders, strip out the adjectives. Adjectives will harm you in the venture world. I don't want to hear about massive traction. I don't want to hear about massive interest. What I want to see are numbers that I can quantify. And so when I start talking to a Series A startup that has never raised a Series A before, I don't think they understand how different it is and how different the conversations with VCs are. These are real conversations. These are real numbers. This is real money being thrown around, right? It's not a $50,000 check. These are multi-million dollar checks. So in terms of how the, the market has changed, take everything I just said and now layer on the fact that venture as an asset class is not as valuable because interest rates are higher. So what that means is the later stage funds, plural, got hit harder. So the funds, you know, the, the Tigers and the people doing Series B, C, and D, those have been hit hard which means anything before that gets hit hard as well. And then pre-seed is kind of the most insulated. So in terms of then versus now, you we are entering, again, I'm not an economist, but a five, 10, 15, 20 year period where interest rates are not at zero, which means you really need to have a model that number one, clearly displays real traction. And I would say number two is a profitable model and has strong unit economics. If those two things are there, a Series A probably is not crazy hard, right? Uh, VCs are going to dig into the metrics, they're going to understand them. But I think where most founders are going to be is they don't have the traction, they don't really have the growth, but they didn't optimize their company early on for profitability. And so they're kind of at the spot where they absolutely need to raise a Series A because they've got no more runway. 
but they probably can't because VCs are looking for real companies that have clearly found product market fit. So I, I hope that made sense. Again, what I'm trying to layer on is, is understanding. It's not just I've heard people say, well, this environment. This environment is going to persist for a long time. I do not see rates going back down to zero soon. And that makes it really hard for venture. So you need to be incredibly buttoned up for the Series A. And, and I think Natalie said this in her talk as well. If you're looking to raise the Series A in the next six months, you probably got to work incredibly hard and it might be impossible. This is something that you need to know probably two, three or four years prior. And you need to start building your pre-seed company with this in mind. Um, you can't suddenly decide to be profitable at the Series A. And unfortunately, what we're looking for as VCs now is companies that are healthy from a balance sheet standpoint, if that makes sense. I hope that wasn't a ramble. I hope that made sense. But I'm trying to tie a lot of different um, sort of macroeconomic factors together into what looks different right now. Last thing I'll add, and, and Dami kind of talked about this as well. Um, this other VC I like in the US had a tweet a couple of years ago, and he said, guys, I found the greatest pitch deck I've ever seen in my life. And you click on it and it takes you to a little JPEG and it is a plain white slide in Times New Roman black font. And it says, actually, we're not raising right now. And so what I want to see as a VC is somebody who's doing well and doesn't need or even want my money. That makes it a lot more attractive to me. So in terms of how you would optimize for a Series A, get yourself in a spot where you don't need investor money and you're showing traction and you'll have more people coming to your door. When you start begging, when the flags start going up in my mind, it's just not a good recipe. So optimize for not needing investor money at a Series A. And then ironically, that will make it easier to get your money at the Series A. That would be my response. Wow, what a fantastic way to end. Like that was super awesome. Optimize for not needing the money at a Series A round so that when you get there, like you don't have to do all the begging. This is super awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew. So um, we do have just two more questions to wrap up the entire session. So I will um, have Dami take the uh, first question and then Dr. Ola will take the last and uh, I guess um, do uh, use that to close out the, the webinar for us. So uh, Dami, I'll just read out the penultimate question. What kind of metrics would you be advising founders, sorry, founders to think about as they raise their Series A or as they make decisions on when to raise Series A? I could take that again if it's not too clear. Yeah, I take that again. Okay, sorry. So what kind of metrics would you be advising founders to think about as they raise their Series A or mm -hmm. as they make decisions on when to raise Series A? What kind of metrics? I think a lot has been said around this, but yeah. You could, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot has been said about that, but I'm just going to touch on, you know, like very key um, key points. I think definitely your profitability. I think that even if you're not currently making um, profit at the point that you're about to raise your Series A funding, there should be an intentional um, um, laid out plan um, in your financials about when you expect to hit that. You know, we raised this money, um, close out our, run, uh, uh, um, our Series A round in October, these are the, you know, pipeline, these are the custom, this is the customer pipeline that we have. If we close out on 50 of those, of, of those customers, we, we expect to hit um, profitability in, you know, at the end of um, December. I think that when you start to tell stories like that, and it's when it's very clear from your financial statements, your historicals, um, from your growth, that that is a, you know, like 90% story to tell. I think that definitely your unit economics is very important. Um, Andrew and um, Natalie already mentioned that. Um, I think that also in terms of growth, I think that investors at your series, they want to see, okay, you know what, if you're in Nigeria, do you have any, do you, know, do you have any um, intentions to expand to um, other countries in sub-Saharan Africa or where exactly do you think that this business is most um, will be most interesting to people. I think that investors also want to um, see, you know, who else is on your team. I, and I think this was also mentioned before, who else is on your team? Because investors understand that you as a CEO, you as a CEO, whatever your role is, um, you might not have, you would not have all the skills, but you need to be able to, you know, um, build a compl complementary team, a team that, you know, would support you through the process but also make sure that when you raise series, uh, you know, the Series A funded, you have the right team to grow the company um, in whatever direction you think, you know, you think is best. Um, I think also investors look at, um, sorry, one of the things that you also need to concentrate on is um, what is your 
what is your um your strategy like your go to market strategy so you raise money um how many products you know do you have in the pipeline um where are you looking to to launch those uh, um what time you need to have specific time periods that you want to launch those um and in what what markets are you also looking to launch those i think that those are the things that as an invest um as a founder you want to be very intentional about um telling your story also i think that um is very key to Helping because investors get you know very excited about um, where you want to be, so they're very they you know they 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 love you know like the now. Um, they're very interested in okay, what do you have now versus where do you want to be? And I think that your ability to paint a big picture, a big interesting and exciting picture of where you want to be in two years, in five years, um, and really just carry that investor along is very critical to you you know to your ability to be able to raise um, um, a great Series A funding. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you so much. Like the ability to paint a, a great picture about where you intend to be. Thank you so much. I guess that is a very awesome way to wrap up from Danny. So, like I said, we have just one more question, which um, which we will pass on to Dr. Ola Brown, and then she will use this to close out the webinar. Apologies, we're a little behind time, so we're not going to be able to take too many more questions. So, and um, the last question to Dr. Ola. People who, who have successfully raised Series A, or rather, people who raised Series A quickly and efficiently, what do you think they did differently from those who took longer time to raise the Series A? Uh, I think you're muted, Dr. Ola. Yeah. I'll give an example from our portfolio um, in terms of um, companies that have raised their Series A, and we still hold them in our portfolio, even though we invested in seed um, at seed or pre-seed. Um, so a great example is Helium Health. Um, they raised their $10 million Series A. Um, and I think the reasons that they were able to raise so quickly um, were a lot of the things that um, we, well, they've raised their Series B now, actually. They raised, I think, a $25 million Series B recently, but they raised their Series A, I think, two or three years ago. Um, and one of the reasons why they were um, so able to raise quickly is, number one, they were growing really fast. Um, so um, investors could immediately see that they had strong fundamentals, they were profitable, um, and that was attractive to investors. So um, one of the things I like to say is that strong fundamentals never go out of fashion. So um, you can never see a business that's growing fast, um, approaching profitability or profitable, strong unit economics, strong team, um, and looks good um, from a financial perspective that investors won't be excited about. It's when you're not you know, reaching those metrics that you have difficulty raising money. Um, but if you're doing well, you don't actually have difficulty raising money um, because investors want those kind of companies and they're few and far between. Um, but they also had their compliance sorted out. So in terms of looking um, at the data room, for instance, um, sort of taxes, um, HR policies, uh, the accounting systems, um, the audited accounts, all the things that an investor wants to see to give them reassurance um, from, uh, um, from a perspective of these people are doing the right things and nobody's going to come and shut them down, right? Um, because the nightmare for an investor is a company that's doing really well but is cutting corners um, because they can get shut down by the authorities, they can get their license revoked, and then that's the end of the company. Um, and we're seeing companies like that in the Nigerian ecosystem that are cutting a lot of corners and eventually, you know, they got shut down or they run into regulatory trouble. And regulatory trouble is the worst kind of trouble that you can get into because that's a government trouble. Um, and getting out of it is, you know, you can end up in some really sticky situations. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of people that have raised their Series A quickly, they've been preparing for Series A since seed and they've been doing the right things since seed. So they've been seeing themselves a step ahead of where they are, of where they currently were in terms of their accounting. And, and I'm not saying go and recruit an accountant from an American listed company that's going to charge you $10,000 like $10, a week or something. Um, don't recruit somebody that is going to like, you know, finish all your money, basically. Um, but at the same time, I think that you need to look uh, and put systems in place to guide people to do the right things. And there's also ways that you can even outsource your accounting um, to have a fractional CFO or something like that, that sometimes is a lot cheaper than bringing in a full-time CFO. Um, so you've got to balance 
having the right compliance with respecting the stage that you are at the entrepreneurial journey. Um, because I think also one mistake that I see people make is recruiting people from big companies. And everybody is McKinsey, everybody is ExxonMobil, everybody is... So they're all like, you know, charging several hundred thousand dollars a year and you just only raise 500k which can really pay for two of those big people but you want 10 of those big people um and then you end up in a situation where you know within a few months your entire seed round has gone on salaries um so that's not a great place to be either but i think getting to the point where um things are in order understanding as a founder the systems and processes you need to put in place to guide potentially less um, experienced people to do the right thing super important the clients from a hr perspective so your pensions for instance remittances any statutory by law remittances should be done um, whether it's tax, whether it's ITF, whether it's um, pensions, all of those things should be done because investors, for them, those are red flags. Um, and then anything to do with accounting. So, you know, cash is probably a big accounts um every month but what a series a investor institutional investor that's going to give you 10 15 20 million dollars wants to see this is billions of naira what they want to see is very very different to what somebody that is giving a 50k check wants to see they want to see all of your accounts in order your cash flow statements in order your treasury management protocols your systems and processes making sure that everything is uh, sort of as it as it's stated and making sure that you're with a reputable auditor as well so making sure that you're getting your audit accounts audited and at that time like I said before it doesn't have to be PwC or Deloitte they can help particularly in the Nigerian environment because if you're trying to attract foreign investors they don't know your auditors but they know PwC they know Deloitte they know EY um so it's not necessary that you get a big four auditor but it's necessary that you get a reputable Nigerian auditor. It can, at that stage when you're raising Series A, it's no longer Uche Uche and Sons. It's somebody that is known, you know, in the industry as, you know, a reputable person, somebody that their work can be vouched for. Um, because otherwise, apart from anything, you can miss some things that actually, the auditors can miss some things that actually become material later when you're when you're raising your series a so um the question was you know what's the difference between the high performers and the people that don't raise the people that don't raise are usually in a state of desperation so they have like two more months of runway to go and they suddenly send an email out of them out to their investors that we want to raise and then you say okay how no pitch deck no accounts no boards no plan poor metrics and they're running out of cash and their burn rate is high because they've gone to employ uh, very expensive people. They've filled up their office. They've gone to an office in Ikoi. The rent is due. They can't pay it. And everything is like a fire, um, firefighting approach to raising money. I think the people that raise and do very well are very strategic. And the people that don't suddenly wake up and realize that they're running out of money a month before they run out of money. Um, and, you know, it's just very haphazard that they can't sort of get their get their hands around the process. Um, so sort of my advice about the journey to Series A, like I said, I said 18 months in advance. Well, if you can start earlier than that, as soon as you finish your seed is a good time to start to start thinking about like a sophisticated company operating like a big company, the more accountable you can be. And I, I would say get a board early, get your board together, even if it's just a patch patch board, the process of having to report to people on a quarterly basis or a half yearly basis, the process of having to answer questions and articulate to people that you're accountable to just makes you more ready for a series A round in general, because you have been speaking about your company, you've been answering questions, you know the questions that are likely to come up because probably those board members, if they're the right people, have been asking the, you those same questions continually, so you have answers for them. You just sound slicker and more sophisticated and more practiced and sort of more ready um, for the level of scrutiny that you'll be, you'll be facing um, at the Series A round. And as an ex-founder, I've experienced all of these things. I've experienced 
having to rebuild my accounts, having to like run after the, you know, different issues around statutory payments. So I, I've been through that process before entering the VC market. So I'm really, really speaking from painful experience. Um, that no matter how small your revenues are, those things need to be in order. And I've used that with and Sons Auditor before. It doesn't work because you think that you're saving money, paying 50,000 naira for an audit or 70,000 naira for an audit, but they miss out things that subsequently, later on in the history, uh, later on in, in the future of the company, then really, really become important and really become material to investors. So um, planning, strategy, and in general, try and get the least patch patch uh, court professionals that you can. Thank you so much, Dr. Ola Brown. Thank you so much. What an awesome way to wrap up this webinar. Thank you so much to all the speakers, the panelists, the book reviewer. Thank you to everyone who participated. So um, this is us coming to join the curtains on the webinar slash book launch. But just before we go, just a couple of things that we need to just run through real quickly. But first of all, I would need to apologize for the um, initial technical hiccups that we experienced. So apparently we are we've been made aware that it wasn't, it's not just unique to us. So it's um, a problem, a global problem from the platform provider, right? So we do even have understand that there's actually a public statement that has been made to that effect. So apologies to everyone who struggled and really struggled to join this webinar and book launch. Apologies for that, which also leads to the apology for the extra time that we had to take because we didn't get to start on time. So um, real quick, just before we draw the final curtains, I would like to say a couple of people have asked questions about a link um, they've asked questions about the recording for the webinar, and yes, a recording will be the recording will be sent to everyone who joined um, who joined us live on this event. So everyone will get a recording for this. Then questions have gone out as well regarding how to get copies of the book. So yeah, please note that. Um, please keep an eye out on our social media handles. You would have a link it down for where you could download the e-copy. Just um, watch down those spaces, and I will be sharing our handles for our social media platforms. Please look out for that, as well as the hard copy. So I guess on our social media handles, you would have a link to download the e-copy. Then you would also be guided how to um, obtain the hard copy of the book. So like I said, our social media handles. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on LinkedIn, also on Instagram with the same uh, handle, Health Cap Africa. Finally, I would say you can send us an email. Um, well, so you can drop us a line using our email um, addresses, the syndicate at healthcap.co. We also have investor relations at healthcap.co. But I will not end this without mentioning that we do run an investor collective. It's called the FDHIC Catalyst Fund. So if you're interested in that, we have a lot of offerings that um, are beneficial to our Catalyst Fund members. If you're interested in that, and I think you should be, then you can drop us a line at our, one of our emails, preferably the syndicate email address, which again is syndicate at healthcast.co. So yes, um, uh, I think at this point, I would want to thank once again, Ms. Damilola uh, Thompson. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the insights you shared. Thank you to Mr. Andrew Furman. It's been a, a great pleasure for, um, having you speak with us and spend this time with us. Um, a couple of people who were here but who had had to leave, thank you to... I, hi, um, Marion. I'm going to stay on for a few minutes because I've noticed that people had technical difficulties, so they're still joining. So I'll just do some Q&As with you um, after the panellists leave because I know the panellists have other commitments today. But because some people are just joining and they're not going to get value if they leave right now, I'll stay on for an extra 10, 15 minutes to my next meeting. Oh, OK, awesome. So, um, right, that's a bonus that came with the webinar. <laughs> Awesome. So that's great. So I guess we would keep on then. Um, but I want to thank Ms. Damilona, who is able to drop off at this point. If thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for being with us. Um, so uh, we do have actually a couple of questions that have flown in. So Dr. Ola would probably 
just give you the floor and then you can address the questions. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. I really appreciate it. So we're just going to have like a fireside chat because so many people came in late because Microsoft just had this problem where Teams wasn't working for a while. Um, best software company, biggest software company in the world, but still having the occasional software problem, which should reassure all the startups. So should we just go through some of the questions um, for the people that are just joining so that at least they get some value in the last sort of few minutes? So the first question um, that I've seen anywhere, I'm sure Marion will also have some of them that she has gathered, is um, what do I do if I'm running out of cash? Oh gosh, um, so really interesting question um, and happens more frequently than um, I guess a lot of people think where the startup model is very different from the SME model. So the SME model where you're not um, sort of raising, raising capital to survive um, is very different from the startup model. Um, most SMEs actually get some kind of startup capital, whether from their family or from the salaries saved. Um, and then they really slowly and gradually build that business over time with customer money. And that's that's what bootstrapping really is, um, really just building a business using customer funding and reinvesting that money back into the business. And even though it seems like venture capital is the only way to build the business, actually most companies never ever raise venture capital. So most companies in the world are not backed by external investors. They're those mom and pop shops, they're those companies, some of them even have grown to be listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange and that was their first real sort of external raise. Um, but a lot of them just don't raise external capital. The only capital that comes into their companies is the capital um, from their customers and they take that capital and reinvest it into the business and then they make a profit the next year and then they take that capital from their profit and reinvest it again into the business and they can just carry on sort of, sort of plodding along, sacrificing a lot, not necessarily paying themselves a salary, um, but slowly being able to grow their business um, with customer funds. And that actually probably makes up, there's something on my LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is um, Dr. Ola Brown. Um, and I, I say that um, most companies across the world, the post says that most companies across the world never raise venture capital or private equity or work um, or list on a public stock exchange. They exist quietly, maybe with a help from with with some help from a bank loan or a microfinance loan. So looking at American companies, for instance, there are about 3000 companies listed on the public stock exchanges. There are about 9000 companies that are private equity backed. There are 40,000 companies that are VC packed, but there are 32 million companies that are SMEs that have never taken any um, external funding. So compare that number, 40,000 to 32 million. Most companies actually aren't raising venture capital. And I think that that's the difference. That's where running out of the question of running out of money um, comes from. The fact that venture capital backed companies are not spending money they've made. They're usually spending investors money with the hope of raising further money to spend. And there's a lag between what they get from customers and what they're spending. Whereas with most small to size, uh, medium, so 40 million companies in America are actually not making as much money as they spend in essence, usually. Whereas um, small to medium sized businesses, those 32 million are usually really plowing back in um, from what customers um, have given them or what they've earned from customers. Um, so in in terms of running out of money, which was um, the question that was asked, um, it means to get into the state where you're running out of money, it means that you're not getting enough from customers, basically. Um, and there's two things that you can do. You can either try, go out onto the streets, um, start selling your products, 
um, and start trying to um, get custom funding, which is a more sustainable way of doing it, particularly if you're in a sub subscription business where once you get a customer, they'll continue to pay you for the next five to 10 years, or um, you can look at raising capital. Um, but the problem with the capital raising route is like we've all said, it probably at this stage um, in the fundraising cycle probably takes about 18 months um, to really put together a capital raise where it only takes sometimes a few hours um, to get a big customer um, or get a reasonable uh, to get to get customers. Um, so you, when you're running out of money, you have to make a decision as to what to pursue. You can either raise capital and you can might you, if you have existing investors, this is the time to call them. But usually if you're communicating well with your investors, then over a period of time, you in collaboration with your investors will be monitoring your runway and your burn rate so you'll be able to say you know we only have 18 months of runway left and now we only have 12 months of runway left and now we only have six months of runway left so that you're carrying your investors along about the state of your cash flow but like i said um and like uh, i believe every panelist um has said paying customers nothing beats paying customers there's companies like Zoho Books, for instance, that do a million a billion dollars in revenue. Companies like Calendly, um, companies like Mailchimp, um, that you know do hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, and they've never um, raised um, external funding, or sometimes um, haven't raised external funding until they were significantly large companies. So always, ha we should always have that um, in the back of our minds as founders. Um, but like I said, there are options available to you, either raising external funding when you're raising money or, you know, going out, pounding the streets and getting customers. Um, and whichever option you need to choose, whatever um, option um, that you want to choose, I think, you know, you need to stay alive. Necessarily, perhaps taking a down. Everybody, it's what your money was eighty million dollars. Um, this year, I think your company is worth ten million dollars. Um, and obviously, if you've raised that. Happy hasn't met metrics or maybe her revenues have um, sort of reduced, then, you know, you might have a materially different um, valuation. Um, and that means that it's actually very difficult to raise funding and you might have to raise at a lower valuation, which is bad for your investors, but also bad for you as an entrepreneur. But it's better to raise a down round than dying. Um, so if you want to keep your company alive um, and you're running out of money, those are the options available. My advice would be like if it's a down round, lots of famous companies all over the world that have gone on to be extremely successful have um, gone through this stage where they've had a down round. So it's not um, a reflection on you. I think it's probably more a reflection on the stage of the market or the timing of the market or the macroeconomic uh, macroeconomic um environment or some war in some country that's making something scarce and causing inflation but that's nothing to do with you so don't take it personal take the money and stay alive um, and you know live to fight another day that would be um, my advice um, another question i got was do margins matter um now that's an interesting question um so just to explain what a margin is um, a margin is the difference between um, your revenue and cost of goods sold. So um, how how much money or how, what is the margin between what it takes you to make the product and what people are paying for it, basically? Um, so software businesses tend to be high margin. Um, we're on Microsoft Teams right now. It's a piece of software that almost everybody, every business in the world pays for. We pay Bill Gates and Microsoft to use access this software. Um, the software package includes Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Word, Outlook, the whole thing. We, we pay yearly for that. And it's unlikely that any business will stop paying for it. But what does it really take Microsoft to produce this software? Nothing. It's the same software that they're giving to everybody. 
So these businesses tend to be extremely high margin businesses because I'm in Ikoyi now and there are probably millions of businesses just on this Lagos island all using the same software and it doesn't take them any more money to give that same software to the next person. So these tend to be very high marginal businesses, uh, marginal and uh, margin businesses, because if it's a pure software business, then they can keep on selling that same thing without having to spend any more money. Now, Uber is a tech company as well. However, Uber, every driver that is onboarded Uber still has to pay something to every new driver. So there's no driver working for free. Every single ride costs them money. So it's not a pure software business. Because every single person takes a ride. Hi, Doctor. The case your network is fluctuating. That way from here. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, so I was explaining the difference in margins um, and saying like um, it costs Uber money for each service that they offer. Um, and then people might say, okay, Netflix is a pure software business. It should have high margins because it's on your screen and they're giving it to everybody. But, um, but Netflix tends to have high costs and lower margins because they actually have to produce a lot of movies. They have to produce a lot of content. They have to buy a lot of content. So a lot of Nollywood are, um, producers, for instance, will make a movie and then charge 10 times what it costs them to make the movie. Um, and Netflix will have to buy it because their product actually relies on them continuing to buy more content for their platform. Microsoft doesn't do that. They just keep on giving you the, soft, the same software. Since I, I can remember when I was old enough to use a computer, it was Windows 95. We're now in 2003. Microsoft has really not changed the product that they're offering drastically. Word still works the same way. Few upgrades to Excel, few upgrades to PowerPoint. It's more or less the same product that they're selling to everybody every year. Um, which is very different to a Netflix that has to continue buying content, which is very different from an Uber, for instance, that has to, for each, each additional piece of business, something needs to go out of the company. So when you're thinking about margins, margins do matter. And you might get a huge valuation for a company like Figma that is selling pure software compared to a more marketplace orientated business that has lower margins. And why are investors paying more for pure software high margin businesses? Because they make more money. Um, so a business like Microsoft um, keeps more of their money with the company than a company where it's costing money um, to deliver each service. Um, or to deliver each subsequent service. Um, whereas um, a company like Microsoft, a company like Figma, these are pure software businesses. There comes a time when the marginal cost of actually delivering an extra unit of product is zero. It's harder for Uber to get to that point and much harder for Netflix to get to that point. So margins do matter. And I think, you know, it's really important to look at your margins and understand what your cost of goods sold is, what your gross margins are, what your net margins are um, and, and how you can present those numbers um, to investors um, in, in a way that supports your story. Marion, have you seen any other questions? I'm just looking yeah, at a few more. Okay, go on. 
Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions that have been coming in, but there's one that we've had repeatedly um, about finance around financial model. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so we've had people ask questions around financial model. So the simple um, um, culmination of all the questions around financial model is do I need a financial model? So let's just by answering that, I guess we get to answer all the questions around financial model. And then there are also others that have been flowing in. So I'll come back afterwards. Fantastic. So do you need a financial model to raise a series A? Um, so I'm going to refer to a question that I heard earlier on, which is, you know, how come some people are able to raise like this massive series A, um, massive series A with like very little revenue? Um, fundraising is very, very, very closely related to the relationships you have. So if you look at the people that raise money in Nigeria, for instance, um, most of them went to school abroad. When you look at the people that raise money in America, most of them raise money easily if they went to Harvard or Stanford or, you know, um, Yale or Princeton. Um, and it's not necessarily because they have better businesses, um, but it's because they have better relationships. Um, if your dad is Warren Buffett, you probably find it easier to raise money than um, if your dad is Mr. Tunji from Ikurudu. Um, so in in that um, sort of with that in the background, um, I'll answer the question on your financial model. Um, in this type of fundraising environment where it's already difficult to raise funding, what investors want to see for uh, to get reassurance is a fantastic looking data room, a data room where they don't have to keep on asking for things. When you send the link to your data room and I um, sort of describe in the book how to prepare your data room, they want to see that you're organized, they want to see that you're professional um, and they want to see that you're prepared. And they take that as a signal of how you're going to run your company subsequently. So do you have to have a financial? If your dad is Bill Gates, no. And the closer that your father is to Bill Gates, the less you need anything that I'm saying. But the further away you are from Harvard, Stanford, Yale, or your daddy being Bill Gates or Aliko Dangote, the more you need to put in to making sure that you do appear, appear like somebody that an investor would want to back. So I would say if you are at the Series A stage um, and you're serious about raising capital, then you should have a financial model. Um, and the financial model, I said I, in the book, I, I describe all of the things that should be components of your financial model. Um, but generally, it's about being able to helping investors to understand your business, helping investors to understand the margins that that business generates and helping investors to understand how many units of those products across different revenue lines um, will lead you um, to your next fundraise, the, the milestones that will produce your next fundraise or your milestones that will produce your IPO or whichever uh, liquidity event um, that your investors are aiming for. But the financial model is important for investors, but it's also important for you. Um, so in the process of building your financial model, reviewing your financial model, your team looking through your financial model, you actually learn a lot about the way your business works, what your revenue drivers are, and what the future looks like for your business. Um, so I think a financial model is useful for investors, um, particularly if you're, you know, raising from strangers. Um, but also it's it's super important for you and it's a really good exercise to go through. It teaches you a lot. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Ola. Yeah. OK, so while you were responding to the question, I just actually took note of it now. You had been talking about margins just before the question on fund on um, financial models. So somebody had asked a question alongside along the lines of your response then. And the person had said. Um, OK, so the person had asked, so why did Microsoft lay off so many people if they have such high margins? I just thought that might be 
a very practical question that we can address? Uh, because they are capitalists. So Microsoft is a fantastic business. They didn't lay off staff because their business, their fundamental business was struggling. They laid off staff because they realized that in the up cycle, the boom cycle, um, they'd gotten a bit fat and lazy and they'd hired probably too many people, more people than they needed. Um, and that from a performance perspective, these people weren't necessarily adding value. So even big companies during a downturn to preserve those margins, preserve that growth, preserve um, those profit levels, they do tend to lay off staff. There's no question about it. Microsoft probably, Microsoft definitely has more money than Nigeria in cash. Like they have more money in cash than our sovereign wealth funds and our excess crude account put together. So they don't have a problem meeting their immediate obligations. Um, but in terms of them looking at their business and looking at how many people are actually adding value to this business, this business, how do we make ourselves lean um, in this time that we don't really know the future? We don't know how long this period of inflation is going to last. In America has, uh, uh, well, central banks around the world have been um, trying to fight inflation. So just like in Nigeria and many parts of Africa, we've noticed that things are getting expensive. Um, Americans have also noticed that things are getting expensive, particularly food, um, and their central banks have really been struggling um, to control um, inflation. So parts of, I guess, a big part of um, Microsoft layoffs um, were, you know, on uncertainty about the macro environment and just making sure that they're in the best, leanest, meanest, um, sort of most flexible and agile state um, to be able to deal with uh, challenges that might come. But definitely, I don't think it was a cash at hand problem. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Doctor. Um, one, another interesting question. OK, so the, this person is saying, Although the first speaker mentioned it, I think they missed it. So they're asking, at what point do you create a board? At what point do you create a board, a board of directors? OK, um, so. Um, I think Maya touched on it and she said she doesn't really, because she's mostly pre-seed and seed, she doesn't really um, sort of advise people to create boards immediately. They should be focusing on the product um, and they should be focusing uh, uh, on getting the business right. Um, as a former founder, I, I had a board as soon as I had a company. Um, and the reason why is not because I needed people to monitor me particularly, um, but because it made me more accountable. So this is from personal experience. The act, people, we as people, even as founders, even as business owners, um, can be a little bit undisciplined. Um, and having to report to people every quarter, they weren't investors um, at the point, at the time, but they were sort of people that had a good knowledge of accounting. They were people that had run businesses before, just made me more disciplined and more prepared for fundraising because they checked my compliance, they checked my treasury, they checked my audit habits, um, they checked the growth of the company and they were early warning signs um, if something was going wrong. They sounded the alarms around, like for instance, we had in 2015 a catastrophic uh, devaluation of the Nigerian currency Naira. And I had a lot of Naira in federal government treasury bills in our, our treasury at the time. The uh, you know, everything is going fine. The exchange rate is 150. Why do I have to worry? And he sat me down and explained, you know, how the Nigerian macro situation works and how we couldn't actually afford to keep our currency at 150. And at the time, he told me that it would never go above 200. So he said, I think you should change it, but I don't think it will ever go above 200. So I changed it because I was so scared of the Nigerian currency going from 150 naira to the dollar to 200 naira to the dollar. 
as I speak to you today, it's almost 800. So obviously, um, as a new entrepreneur, I was in my early 20s, I really didn't understand economics and I didn't understand some of the things that would were could um, bring huge shocks to my business. Um, so a board kind of helps you see round corners um, and also gives you a sense of accountability. So even if it's just an advisory board, my advice would be put one together. What can you lose um, from the cadence of accountability of reporting um, to people that are more experienced on a regular basis? Um, it doesn't really cost anything. The one thing that you know we have in excess is old people, lots of professors, um, lots of old retired people that really want to give back. And those are the kind of people um, that you should be um, targeting. They don't necessarily have to be you know, successful entrepreneurs. They don't have to be, um, they can be subject matter experts. They can be people in consulting firms for a long time and retired and just want something to do to keep them busy. Um, but there's plenty of them. Your friend's dad, a lawyer. Lawyers are always useful people to have on boards. Um, they have a very, very wide skill set um, and they think broadly about things. So if you have a lawyer friend, a retired judge friend, these kind of things, your parents' um, friends, then these are great people to have on boards um, and they create that sense of accountability, number one, um, and they help you see around a few corners that you might not have the experience to do on your own. And also, in addition, entrepreneurship is actually really lonely. It can be such a lonely journey, particularly in your 20s. I mean, most of my friends, when I was running my company, most of my friends were so, so, struggling to get NYSC certificate. NYSC is a mandatory service that you do after university in Nigeria. Most some of my friends were unemployed. A lot of my friends were still in university. So I actually had nobody to talk to about what I was doing. I had nobody to talk to about my business. So another thing that the board of directors gave me is just people to chat to about how frustrated I was feeling at times and how lonely I was feeling at times. Times and uh, and it was really helpful. So um, for people that weren't here at the beginning, I just wanted to go through the Series A cheat sheet again. I'll go through it a lot faster um, than um, I did before. And I don't know if I can enlarge this, or I don't know if you can um, see it that well. But um, I just wanted to refer to it because a lot of the questions um, are, are, um, have been referring to this. So this is a kind of Series A funding checklist. Um, and it starts with um, your Series A um, funding, so your um, fundraising process and making sure that that's right, um, making sure that you have some kind of software, whether Excel, whether Google Sheets, whether some CRM software, so you can track all the investors that you're speaking to and um, be accountable. And you can put somebody in charge of that checklist, to, um, that um, software or um, that Google Sheets to say, you know, Send me a reminder when I need to send. When you're sent, when you're speaking to fifty different investors, you need some way of categorizing them all and um, sort of um, making sure that you're delivering um, when you say that you deliver um, and following them up. Because some of them ghost as well. Some of them ghost for a while and will not answer you. And you know you you have to keep in communication with them somehow. So monitoring that can be done um, either with a CRM or with a plain Excel sheet. Um, and then communication with your employees, making sure that all, all of your employees know that you're fundraising. Um, because if they're not, they will wonder why they're having to do so much extra work um, that you did when you weren't fundraising. Um, if you're very operational in the business and the day-to-day -day business, they might not see you as much you're always with investors or chasing investors. Um, so definitely communication, having a town hall and explaining that you're going into the fundraising process um, is super important. Um, the third thing is compliance, tax, pensions, HR, HMO, all of those things become material when you're raising a um, series, um, series A funding. So just making sure that in terms of compliance, you have everything. Don't skip on compliance. Um, it becomes really, I mean, there's so many compliance red, red flags um, that happen when you're raising capital. Um, so just make sure that from a compliance standpoint, you're completely compliant. Um, key financial model components. Um, I put their um, projections. I've spoken about cost projections, profit and loss statements, um, capital expenditure projections and sensitivity analysis should be on your financial model. Obviously, you can't have every single thing, but try and make your financial model as robust as possible because it helps educate you about your business and it also helps educate investors. 
key team members that you should be speaking to, head of sales, head of HR, head of finance, lead engineer, heads of projects, chief of staff. Some of these roles in a small company might all be the same person or some of them might be the same person, um, but just make sure that you're speaking to your key executives um, about the process of fundraising and what that means. Um, and you're speaking to them saying, look, I might not be doing as much work in the office because I'm fundraising, but you're also speaking to them saying investors during their due diligence will be speaking to you. And these are the things that you need to know. If you need anybody to take an FMI or an ACCA or an ICAM um, to upskill themselves, um, then this is the time, you know, in advance of your um, Series A to do it so that they actually have the, the right uh, skills uh, to be able to speak to um, investors. Um, alternatives to Series A we've discussed, customer funding, venture debt, um, bridge funding, crowdfunding are all alternatives to raising a Series A and we've all seen um, technology companies do all of them to some extent very well as opposed to raising a Series A. Um, I've spoken um, about um, pitfalls to avoid. I spoke about that extensively. You need to put, it costs money to raise money. So make sure you have an appropriate budget for consultants, for travel if necessary, to be able to raise money. Um, crafting a forwardable blurb, I spoke about at the beginning um, and I speak about in the book, uh, making sure that you have a well-crafted, well thought about forwardable blurb that people can just ascends to investors without having to make much effort um, because it allows them to make introductions better and it makes your introductions more effective. Um, corporate documents that you need in your data room, um, so your financial statements. I keep on saying this because I've made this mistake before. If your company started in 2012, then you need to show from June 2012 to June 2023, a profit and loss statement, a cash flow statement and a balance sheet for your entire existence. If you don't have it, you need to build it from your bank statement and you need to do it before going into the capital raising process because these are the things that turn investors off. Um, so you, you can completely ruin your chance with an investor if those things are not in your data room or when they're asked for, you can't produce them in a, in a quick manner. The slower you are, the more discouraging it is um, to, to investors. Um, and then crafting your story, putting together your deck, your financial records, I've already spoken about as well. So I just wanted to go all over those things because I know that a lot of questions that have been asked um, are to, to, do with, um, to do with those things. Any other questions before I go? <laughs> um, like thirsty? <laughs> well, well, I haven't had any more 10 hours. So are there any last questions? I wanted to just make sure that the people that joined late and um, because of the technical issues still got some value out of it. Yeah, which is really awesome because you've done justice. So then most of the questions that are, are just repetitions of what um, you have said before in, so they're just coming in various different ways, but um, basically we're done. So um, yeah, but maybe you may just want to address this very last, this tune is the last one actually, and then we can call it a wrap right after that. And so the person simply says, is it important to mention to a VC the amount you've personally invested in your startup. So we would, can wrap up with that. Yeah, that will be on your cap table. So if you're on the cap table, um, you, you have sort of uh, an amount of equity and they'll know whether that is um, sweat equity or whether it's, um, whether it's financial equity as well. So that will be in the documents definitely. Um, and um, this is, specifically um, your, your cap table. So they will know that from looking through your accounts um, and also looking looking through your financial statements. And that's why financial statements are important. They'll see the amount of money that you put in at the beginning. And then also um, on your cap table, it will become obvious from um, what you own if you actually invested at a certain valuation. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone. Like it's it's amazing. A lot of people are still on the link. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you so much. It's been an honor hosting this webinar, having you guys join us, participating. And we have we're seeing all your comments. Thank you so much. And like we did say, a lot of people are asking for the book. You will get the book. Like, so I'll just reiterate again for those who well, we would have people who are still joining that. Also awesome. So just reiterating again real quick, um, please um, keep an eye out on our social media platforms for a link where you can get a downloadable copy. That's the ebook. Um, our social media handles, it's been dropped already in the, uh, the 
chat comment section. It was there, but I think we'll just read out again. So all our social media handles, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, they're all the same at Health Cap Africa. So please um, watch that space and you should see a downloadable link in the few in the next few days where you can access your own copy, free copy of the ebook. However, if you're more interested in getting the hard copy of the book, still keep an eye out on our social media handles and you would um, probably see a wait list where you can put up your name and then we'll um, have the book sent over to you or you'll be guided accordingly. So please watch our social media platforms for that. Once again, apologies for any technical difficulties anyone experienced. It's really um, a global issue um, related to the platform, pro the platform provider. Again, you can we're reachable at um, our email addresses, which have equally been put out on the in the comment section. But just to go by it again, you can reach us at syndicate at healthcap.co. We're also reachable through investors without relations at healthcap.co. And yes, again, we do have an investor collective. It's called FDHIC Catalyst Fund. Trust me, it's a collective you want to be part of. It's a community that offers a lot of benefits. So um, you want to join us because so all of these learnings that we have now and you are not really uh, we're finding it difficult to close out on the webinar because there are lots of questions. Trust me, if you join this collective, you would get a lot of these um, investment uh, learnings, teachings, and it comes as part of our offerings. There are a lot more offerings that we that you tend to you start to benefit if you join our collective. So we have, like I said, monthly webinars. You have access to deals that have been vetted for investments and a lot more. If you are interested, please drop us in line with our email handles and then we will reach out to you and engage accordingly. Dr. Ola Brown is also reachable on social media. She's pretty active and very um, engaging on Twitter, on LinkedIn and her social media handles. We will also put them in the comment section so you can reach out to her and engage directly. As many of you know, she's a comrade on Twitter. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, everyone. Once again, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you for putting this on your schedule. Thank you for sticking with us up until the end. Thank you for enduring whatever difficulties that you were faced with. We'll be wrapping up at this point. Um, happy Salah to as many who are celebrating and for as many who are not, happy long weekend. Um, take care, everyone, and God bless. <laughs>